been a leader and a team player all her life. Co-chair CEFOG, Foxy representative to CEFOG, vice president Foxy, IOCG governing council member. Also, she's a you know prolific writer, researcher, and pre-reviewer. Presented many papers in, and represented the country also uh, to the WHO. She's also uh, authored many books and delivered various you know orations. Uh, honored at uh, for all this work, she has been honored at national and international forums for exemplary work to reduce maternal mortality, community services, and women empowerment, namely Foxy Patan Bhushan Kamla Bai Hotspot Award, and uh, many other awards. She's a Wadi Foxy Super Achiever as well, and Pride of Foxy Award, Foxy Star Award 2016, and recipient of Dr. N.A. and Dr. Shal uh, Shalja Pandit Award for Women Empowerment. She's also been awarded for her work during COVID times uh, uh, by the Economic Times Award. She's Director and Senior of Zangani Jeevan Jyoti Hospital and Medical Research Center. And we know she has been working very hard to, uh, towards you know, her aspiration of becoming the Foxy President. And we all wish her uh, lots of luck. And she's been working really hard for it. Uh, Dr. Shala, how do you introduce your own student? Uh, she, you know, whatever she's doing today, I think I feel so proud because the success of a teacher always reflects in her students. She has, she's currently the associate professor and unit head of the uh, medical education unit, Rashtri Medical Research Institute, affiliated to various, you know, bodies, founder and president. This is her life's, you know, greatest achievement and a lot of work. And she's formed a wonderful team. Apurva is also part of that team, founder and president of Society of Menstrual Disorders and Hygiene. Very, very eco-conscious and uh, very sensitized. So many people and were lots, uh, you know, won lots of awards for all this work. She's also been chief editor for various journals, reviewers, published also more than 40 papers and many chapters in books. And all this has been awarded by WHO, Award of Excellence in MHM Promotion by Gramale and Ministry of SW, uh, SDW, Foxy Leaders of Tomorrow Award, Foxy Mrs. Shalja Pandit Award, uh, Prash, uh, Prashasti Patra by Government of Uttar Pradesh Bareilly. And uh, we are really proud that uh, uh, Stilber Society of India has so many you know, uh, who's who literally, you know, of uh, all over India, people have joined us for this noble cause. Um, I now hand over the proceedings to uh, Dr. Sadhna and her team and Apurva, uh, who's going to conduct the rest of the program. Thank you so much for all of you for being here. Welcome everyone. I would request Dr. Sadhna ma'am to kindly start with a welcome address to everyone. Uh, thank you, Apurva. And it is a real great pleasure today because uh, the two very important and two young platform, that is the North India Gaini Forum and Still Birth Societies of India has joined together. And it is a real pleasure to welcome all dignitaries, faculties and the August viewers, as well as our dynamic team of the Public Awareness Committee of Stilbar Society of India, Sehla, Apurva, and Neharika. Uh, so uh, we, um, we, in, uh, we welcome you all. And uh, why this uh, um, Dr. Deepika Deka is with us, with the eminent chairperson, Dr. A.G. Radhika, Dr. Minu Vaishya, Dr. Arun Arora. And uh, why this uh, topic we have chosen this program? Because that a prevention of stillbirth in our country is one of the our national health priority. And our country is set for having the single digit that is three by 1000 stillbirth in our country. I am fortunate to have the first WHO sensitization meeting in Sri Lanka in 2014 for three days for the prevention of stillbirth because not much before, it is just 2014, the WHO and the world was sensitized that we are having a lot of loss of lives in the late gestational age and this is a silent tragedy so this this sister birth society of india is a brainchild of dr tamkeen and dr neelam and i congratulate her for her consistent effort 
a very very good academic material which we get from the prevention of stillbirth society of india and ongoing webinars this is our first webinar and we have taken the topics because this is a public awareness committee when the family is like looking for a healthy happy baby they are getting ready with their clothes and with the toys and the upcoming ceremonies when there is a sudden stillbirth they are not mentally ready for it however do from our part we have some gaps in the knowledge gaps in the communication because the people must be aware that there are chances of having the birth complication in the last trimester and that's why we have taken the topic for the discussion today of many many things which are the people's there are a question in people's mind is there ultrasound report of cord around the neck does it matter on what position mother sleeps does it matter should she, the mother can have the fasting and then feasting does it matter so we are going to have a wonderful discussion beside this the birth defect contribute to around 1 to 5% of all stillbirth and we have none other than dr deepika deka and actually she will be taking lead on many many front many society she has been the president of fetal medicine society of india and at the north india gynae forum also dr deepika is going to take the lead on the prevention of birth defect which is so very important for our country so we look forward for a joining for the collaboration for the networking and talking to the people so that people are sensitized what thing should be done and what thing should be done what should what thing should be taken like quietly and what thing should be taken very very carefully so looking forward to a wonderful discussion and i congratulate isela because i am just going to have a flight connectivity and dr sela is going to take lead in the panel though i will be up to the last moment before i board and we all look forward to a great session stay together till the end you will definitely going to take few very very important carry home points in your clinical practice thank you very much thank you dr tamkin thank you apurva and thank you dr sharda jain i cannot like the my regard sincere my uh, like all that and all the highest regards to dr sharda jain who is always with us though she has an any issue or not just after surgery after two or three days she was there and her like commitment and the what the time and what idea she gave dr sharda jain is something a legendary leader which we look for and the young generation will going to have a lot of inspiration and motivation from dr sharda jain beside being expert in every field so a warm welcome and our all young panelists as well so we are looking forward they are all right like, uh, very very young dynamic people and we are going to have a great discussion so thank you very much uh, everyone and thank you for being with us thank you very much thank you very much ma'am as we proceed towards our academic session we welcome dr sharda jain ma'am thank you ma'am for joining us ma'am can we have a few words a few words of blessings from you before we start ma'am please i think i congratulate uh, dr tamkin and dr sadhna uh, to focus on uh, such a very important topic especially on the public awareness front and uh, it's high time that you know uh, we focus not only on mortality as well as uh, for perinatal mortality especially the stillbirths uh, we are celebrating that you know maternal mortality has decreased to 100 but uh, recently when these people met in south africa we were india was at the bottom so i think you know similar situation is there as for the stillbirths are concerned and i think in our own country we should take an example of kerala i'm sure with the support of this new uh, branch which has opened up uh, every gynecologist uh, should be part of it and should actively participate in this uh, the aim is not very difficult and i i think you know uh, the problem comes uh, when we don't have standardized protocol if we have standardized protocol uh, every last person uh, gynecologist uh, in the remotest area can follow those kind of things uh, is there 
so i think i i give my good wishes to all of uh, person who are uh, participating in this especially uh, dr sadna and dr tamke and from this particular platform again i uh, you know because uh, i see sadna traveling so much uh, i feel you know uh, she requires a lot of blessings for her effort should be fruitful thank you very much thank you so much ma'am thank you so much can we proceed with the scientific session ma'am so as we start with the scientific session the session is today on prevention of birth defects well as obstetricians we deal with two lives one of which is the unborn and the other which awaits awaits its birth with joy with happiness with anxiety and with lots of apprehensions the joy and the happiness turns into a nightmare when a birth defect is detected we all have seen our patients suffering from birth defects and we need to know more about it that is why we have today a session by none other than dr deepika deka on prevention of birth defects let me take the privilege of introducing our experts for today let me welcome professor uma pande madam is md bhu and frcog she is the professor and head of department at ims bhu varanasi and an examiner for mrcog exams she was the principal investigator for the champion trial and the trial findings were incorporated in who pph recommendation welcome madam thank you next we have dr arun arora who is presently working as a consultant at pushpanjali life hospital and associate professor at the white medical college sir is an endoscopic surgeon and reproductive medicine specialist he is the joint secretary at jammu obstetrics gynae society and founder secretary at indian fertility society jammu chapter we welcome you sir and we are very happy to have you here next we have dr a g radhika madam is a senior consultant obgy at ucms gtb hospital delhi she is the honorary secretary of aogd 2023 and 24 and in guide certified level 2 trainer for guideline development with a number of awards recipient of icog visiting professor award foxy corion award foxy best paper awards and a number of publications 75 publications and cochrane collaborations ma'am has a vast academic experience we welcome dr radhika we also have with us dr meenu vaish who is the dehradun president uttarakhand chapter obgy practicing at vaish nursing home with a special interest and expertise in high risk pregnancies in fertility treatment and art we welcome dr meenu vaish i would request our experts to kindly introduce the speaker for today dr deepika dekha Dr. Uma, can you do the honors? Uh, of Dr. course, ma'am. Yes. Of course, ma'am. I would be delighted. Great to have you. Thank you. Uh, um, it's my honor to introduce the Pika, ma'am. She is such a renowned consultant, and she was in AIMS. Uh, so she is gold medalist in MD and Obstetrics and Gynae and FICOG, and she has fellowship in maternal fetal medicine, and that too from uh, from USA as well as from UK Fetal Medicine <coughs> Foundation. she is a senior consultant of fetal medicine global ultrasound fetal medicine dwarka sector 7 uh, president dwarka delhi gynecological forum dgf former uh, professor in unit head she is uh, maternal head medicine chief division of aims new delhi uh, um, i remember when she was she went as a vice chancellor to university of health sciences assam she is director aims kalyani which is in in calcutta past president founder uh, vice president of society of fetal medicine past chairman of genetic and fetal medicine committee fox cogd isoparm i'm sure she has lots of publication 258 books edited and chapters in books of 64 a uh, panel lectures invited talks papers presented international 51 national 700 awards cl jawari award uh, cs dawn imaging science medical disorders in pregnancy a uh, um, uh, dr amrendra nath award rogam research award faops asia ocean oceania young scientist award narchi and isobar kamla acharya award sk bhandari gold medal 2002 and djf abdul kalam award 2022 best foxy publication book 
uh, introduction to genetics and fetal medicine. That's a wonderful CV, madam. Uh, and thank you, Sadhana ma'am, for uh, asking me to read. And now, uh, uh, Deepika ma'am, the floor is all yours. We, we are all keen to hear you. Thank you very much. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Sadhana, uh, Dr. Sadhana, as well as uh, Dr. Damkin for inviting me here today. And uh, of course, I seek the blessings of uh, a patron of one of my newly started ventures, the uh, Professor Shada Jain. It's very nice. Thank you, Dr. Uma and all the chairpersons, respected chairpersons. I shall now uh, proceed with my presentation. So um, I shall go directly to the point. And we are talking about how to prevent, you know, prevention of birth defects. WHO definition is that any defect in the baby born after birth is a birth defect, whether it is structural or functional. If the child is uh, hard of hearing or is also cannot see, that is also a defect. If the child is mentally retarded, that is also a defect. Thalassemia, we were discussing in the group, that's also a defect. So all these defects, you know, earlier I used to read and uh, research by Dr. Aisi Verma had shown that it was three to 5% of all pregnancies. I was horrified to see the WHO definition yesterday that it is 6% because we have been able to cut down on other conditions like malnutrition and uh, uh, dehydration and all that. So congenital malformations, birth defects are coming up on the higher, on the list of stillbirths. So it's very, very important for a society like this to be really able to prevent the birth of a child with a birth defect. Oh, why isn't my slide moving? Okay. So this was the earlier slides, you know, where we found that malformations were about two to 5%, chromosomal abnormalities were about 0.5%, and under the 0.6% were single gene disorders like thalassemia, Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, spinomuscular atrophy, and all that. The yeah. biggest problem is whenever I talk or counsel couples, they say, Hamara ghar mein to kisi ko koi genetic problem nahi hai, even if a Down syndrome screen comes positive. That's because 90% of these would occur in low risk women. And that is why. American College of Obzingani, RCOG, and Foxy, they warned that all pregnant women should be screened for birth defects in utero. These are the various causes, chromosomal, teratogen, <laughs> single gene disorders, multifactorial, but the problem is that a large, of the, large percentage of them are still unknown. But every obstetrician, need not be a geneticist or a, we don't even expect them to be a fetal medicine specialist. A fetal medicine specialist is someone who has put in one to three years of rigorous training, hands-on, counseling, procedures, everything. But obstetricians are expected to know about the common defects. The common defects, chromosomal abnormalities would be 21, 18, 13, Kleinfeinters, Turner syndrome, and of the major single gene disorders are sickle cell disease. As you know, the government is taking steps for the prevention of sickle cell anemia in our country. We also have thalassemia. <clears throat> then we have hemophilia, which you know I have been dealing with the Hemophilia Society of India. And it's a very really sad sort of a condition. Children cannot run, they cannot play. What terrible life they have. And of course, we have congenital malformations, heart disease, cleft lip, cleft palate, minor and major malformations. Besides, of course, conditions like albinism. Today, I had a patient with a previous child with an albinism, and they really cannot fit into the normal society. So it becomes a problem. Then uh, we have <clears throat> conditions where the mothers are on medicines. You know, they could be taking warfarin. We have a large group of patients <clears throat> who have 
heart valve replacements, or the mothers are on immunosuppressants, imatinib, RHI seminized. So all these mothers could also have babies which have defects. These, this child has very enlarged calf muscles. That's because it has Duchenne's muscular dystrophy. This is the typical floppy baby. And so these are muscular disorders. And then complications of twin pregnancies, especially twin-twin transfusion syndrome, where both the babies, you know, the donor as well as the recipient could land up in stillbirth. So these are the various problems that we deal with. It. Besides, of course, then we have syndromes. Nowadays, we are doing ultrasound. We are finding more and more abnormalities which don't fit in somewhere. So these could be syndromes like orthogryposis, golden hair syndromes. See, we don't want, uh, we don't expect obstetricians to know details about all this, you know, syndromes and so on. So, but then they should know how to diagnose, how to screen and how to refer. Only then will you be able to prevent stillbirths by preventing birth of such babies. This was one of my cases on ultrasound, harlequin ichthyosis, baby died after birth. So the question is, is it possible in today's day and age to prevent the birth of a baby with birth defect or even a handicap? We should not be able to see this sign anywhere. Yes, by the vigilant obstetricians. How? By screening for fetal congenital malformations and also for the genetic conditions, hereditary conditions during the pregnancy or even before pregnancy. And then the important thing is primary prevention, secondary prevention, and then comes the tertiary prevention where they refer to the fetal medicine specialist on time. I always talk about time. You know, there was a time in the 90s and the 20s where obstetricians used to refer high drops babies to me uh, for intrauterine transfusion. I was then, you know, uh, chairman of the genetic committee of Oxy. I went around the country saying the you know, major lecture always used to be refer before high drops develops in RHI civilization. And that worked. And now people refer as soon as the ICD titles are more than one in 16. And that has brought the stillbirth rate down and with a success of almost 98%. This would decrease the mental, social, economic burden of a preventable condition. There was a, a you know, video here that was viral yesterday of a child in Jammu born with Down syndrome. And the family, the whole society, the group there wanted that nursing home to be closed down. And the doctor was attacked. So legal suits also you have to think about, save your skin. Because ultimately our aim is to give couples a healthy baby. Who is the team leader? Obviously the obstetrician, because it is the obstetrician who's looking not only after the mother, but the fetus as well. But it is teamwork and you would need the referrals to fetal medicine specialists, radiologists, geneticists, laboratory medicine people, you know, for your investigations. Today we were talking about HPLC, diagnosis of thalassemia. Lab people are so important. And then depending upon the malformation, whether it is a heart disease or a kidney disorder or a, a you know, a ventricular enlargement, you have to have the help of the expert. The obstetrician should not be the expert for everything. There are experts, there are people trained. Make use of them for the best outcome. So what is primary prevention? Well, which doesn't happen. So it starts with before pregnancy. So the risk people are those who are above the age of 35, though downs can occur in women even at the age of 20, I have seen. Family history, there is, today I got a woman who says that my mother gets blood transfusion every month and she didn't even know that it was thalassemia. It was very funny. <laughs> so the ignorance in our country is tremendous and we really need awareness programs. Previous child, you know, not only just a child, if somebody in the family has thalassemia, has hemophilia or any other blood dyspepsia, the whole family blood relative should be screened. Similarly, we need to see for 
teratogen exposure pre-pregnancy, don't ask women to have any teratogenic drug or radiation before the periods are due. Today, there were a lot of discussions about what happens if somebody had a hysterosalpingogram and conceived in the same cycle. Rubella injection, vaccination in that cycle and conceived in the same cycle. So all these things should be prevented. Obviously, everybody does the maternal health screening, but I don't know if all obstetricians know how to take a three-generation family history, a three-generation genetic history. It's not difficult. Even your nurse can do it. All you have to do is draw this family tree. The males are square, the females are round, and then affected will be uh, red and the unaffected will be the green. This is how you need to draw the family tree and enter them so that you know the hereditary pattern and you know whether this is an autosomal recessive or an autosomal dominant condition. This much obstetricians must know in today's practice. The blood pressure is better to do the mean arterial pressure and the normal is around 7200. <clears throat> Again, pre-pregnancy BMI should be optimal. Otherwise, you either tell the patient to increase her weight. If she's 34 kg or 40 kg, I get lots of cases like that. Or if she's 80, 90 kg, ask her to cut down. Of the investigations, please, HPLC is a must. Hemoglobin A2, because we do have a lot of cases of sickle cell disease, hemoglobin E, and so on. In India, we know that it is a diabetogenic place. We need to do the blood sugar screening. And those who are diabetic have to do their hemoglobin A1C. The age, you all know, the risk with the trisomy. Now, I am dividing this with the period of gestation so that you know what the risk is in, at the time you do the nuchal translucency, at the time that you do the second trimester scan, and at the time of birth. Hemoglobin A1C especially can be done if women are on the higher side of the blood sugars. Anyone with a hemoglobin A1C 13 to 14% has a 20% risk, mainly fetal heart disease, kidney, brain, spinal cord. So some people even opt for a termination of pregnancy, but I would say here that, no, that is not really necessary. You should be, however, controlling the blood sugar's emergency with insulin, admit the patient, control the blood sugars, and do the ultrasound for any abnormalities. Today, I got this very interesting data as well. What happens if the mother is a diabetic, father is a diabetic? Well, the chances in the child increases. A lot of women are on epileptic drugs. Valproic acid is the most dangerous one. Of course, other uh, the anti-epileptic drugs do have problems, but if she's on valproic acid, please shift her over to a less teratogenic drug as soon as possible, before planning pregnancy preferably. You obstetricians must know what period of gestation, which teratogen can affect which organ. So you see, in the embryonic phase, heart can be affected even as early as three weeks. And then, of course, in the second, um, you know, weeks later on, in the second trimester, the problems of malformations are much lesser, but it is mainly a physiological problem that can happen. <clears throat> so next is a secondary prevention, which obstetricians are mainly doing. So they do the combined screen. So obstetricians need to know how to interpret. You will be surprised that a very senior obstetrician in where uh, recently thought that one in 50 was a normal risk and did not advise uh, an amniocentesis or refer to a fetal medicine specialist and just did an NIPT and the baby had Noonan syndrome. So you see, if uh, it's better that you refer high risk cases to the fetal medicine specialist. And these are the various conditions, an abnormal 
dual marker screen, or there is history of any genetic disease in the family, then uh, there is a structural malformation diagnosed on the first trimester scan, and so on. Recurrent miscarriages, especially those with uh, uh, chromosomal abnormalities, they need special counseling. This is one table I want every obstetrician to remember, that at the dating scan is best done at nine to 10 weeks. Patients come to us at six weeks, then seven weeks and eight weeks. Why do you do that unless you're suspecting ectopic? Just a diagnosis of pregnancy, that's all, can be done around five, six weeks. But the dating is better done at around nine weeks. You can get to know the number of fetuses and you can even see some malformations. But we are now having the inverted triad that I said that most of the diagnosis should be made in the first trimester, not in the second trimester. And that is, you should know how to calculate and interpret the combined screen. This is something I want to stress because most obstetricians do not know what a normal PAPI is or what a normal beta ICG is. They only look at the figure, the final figure, and that also is interpreted wrongly very often. Of course, comes next the markers, ultrasound markers for aneuploidy, malformation in the 11, 13 week scan. Preeclampsia, Asia, Pitham birth also should be screened because they have an effect on stillbirths. They have an effect on the baby's life after birth. If they haven't done the first trimester screen, quadruple marker is at 16 weeks and an early genetic scan if they've not had an 11 to 13 week scan or in a high risk case. ISWOG also says that obstetricians must be able to read ultrasound reports. You don't have to do the level two and the level one ultrasound, but you must know what to look at. You know, the way we look at hemoglobin report, you know, must know how to read an ultrasound report, a dual marker report, okay? You must know how to assess the risk for trisomies, whether the nasal bone is there, nuchal translucency, what is the upper limit, and definitely malformations. So if the nuchal translucency is more than 2.5, this is just a gross one, or there is more than 3.5, it is suggestive of 18, more than seven is suggestive of Turner syndrome and so on. The CRL also will be lesser. There is early onset IUGR in trisomy 18 and the fetal heart rate, you know, may increase or decrease, decreases in 18 and increases in breast. <clears throat> you must also know which percentile is reported in the ultrasound, you know? So a percentile according to this, more than the, uh, uh, the 95th percentile is very, very important when you talk about the nuchal translucency. So this is the correct view. You're looking at the nuchal translucency, the IT, and then you look also looking at the nasal bone. So these type of charts you must have hanging on your walls of your, uh, of your uh, clinics so that you can just refer to immediately and say, okay, the NT is high because the nuclear translucency is different at different period of gestation. And if you find, you know, pictures like this, you should straight away refer to the fetal medicine specialist. Because nuclear translucency is something that we look at first nowadays in the 13 week scan. And it is not just chromosomal abnormalities. It could be associated with cardiac defects, skeletal dysplasias, other genetic disorders. It could be associated with so many Noonan syndrome, Turner syndrome, alcohol embryopathy, more single gene disorders. So, you know, this is not something which a general obstetrician needs to know. Refer on time and prevent the birth of a baby with a gen genetic disorder. This was one of my cases where there was the nasal bone was very irregular. And this was a case of trisomy 18. So a hyperplastic nasal bone or an absent nasal bone also is a very important marker in the first trimester. You have to see whether the nose, the nasal bone has been seen, you know, by the ultrasonologist to whom you referred. Some anomalies should not be missed in the first trimester. It can be detected with almost 99% accuracy. 
and then kefali you know congenital rhyme in fact first trimester with this good machines can detect almost all malformations and of course you have the three dimension ultrasound where you can see the beautiful spina bifida in a 11 week fetus even this is actually a 10 week fetus <clears throat> So what I mean to say is that when I'm called in to do ultrasounds for dating and I see a fetus like this, what do I see? I know that this baby has a chromosomal abnormality. Okay. So even the dating scan <clears throat> before the 11 week scan can detect. So the earlier, the better. So these are cases which we have seen and diagnosed in our center. A meningomyelitis at eight weeks. Next, you should be able to interpret PAPE, free beta HCG, which is the best time. Not eight weeks, not 14 weeks. When we have so many things, you know, you know that none of them are good. But I'm cutting off the triple markers or the double test. I'm, I'm just cutting them because they know they're, they're absolute now. So in the first trimester, you should do the combined test, which is biomechanical plus ultrasound, nuchal translucency, free beta HCG, PAPE, and combine together and then give the risk calculation. But if the woman doesn't come, comes in the second trimester, then the best is a quadruple marker along with an early genetic scan. Because... With the quadruple, uh, with the triple marker, you only diagnose 73%, but with a combined screen, you can diagnose as high as 85 to 90%. So the accuracy increases. Now, I think I'll skip this slide because this may confuse you because research has found that at various times, 10 weeks is the best time actually to do a PAPE. And the time to do the free beta HCG is actually the 12th week. But for patient convenience, we combine it all together. <clears throat> then this is again how you diagnose or suspect a chromosomal abnormality depending upon the beta HCG and the PAPE. Dear obstetricians, please concentrate here. Any PAPE, the combined report may come as less than one in 10,000, but look beyond. Look at the actual MOM levels. An MOM of PAPE, which is low, is bad, especially below 0 0.2, 0 0.3. And a high beta HCG for trisomy 21 or a low beta HCG for trisomy 13 and 18. These are red flags. You please learn how to read the MOMs of beta HCG and PAPE. And then the risk is calculated by the computer. And if it is high risk, more than 1 in 250, refer. If it is intermediate risk between 1 and 250, you should again refer because there are many other things that you need to see. <clears throat> A few words about NIPT, which is so popular now. So this is cell-free DNA from the fetal apoptosis cells. If you compare with NIPT and amniocentesis, again, there's a red flag. Please don't empirically do an NIPT. People are straight away going in for an NIPT if the nuclear translucency is high or things like that. However, its ability to detect various chromosomal abnormalities is limited. You cannot diagnose triploidy, something. And switching over from amniocentesis to NIPT, the day has still not come. NIPT cannot diagnose 100%, you know, and its significance, its sensitivity, especially for other chromosomal defects, it's much lesser, okay? And especially there could be false negatives and false positives. So there are limitations to the NIPT. Confined placental mosaicism could be there also. So these needs a little more experience than what a general obstetrician is expected to know. Next, what else? 
you should be able to pick up which cases are likely to develop preeclampsia, preterm birth, IUGR, by the uterine artery PR, PI, by the cervical length assessments, and also by the PAPE and the beta HCG. So all this should be combined, and then you assess what is the risk for the mother to go into preterm birth, for her to develop preeclampsia, and for the baby to have early onset IUGR, and whether to give prophylaxis or not. <clears throat> So this is, uh, there's enough data to show that they are quite useful. And the pulsity index, again, is very important for you to know what is the mean, what is the fifth centile, and what is the 95th centile. So this graphs actually should be hanging on the walls of your clinics because you need to read the report to be able to read the report, which comes in something like this, okay? And then how much aspirin to give? We have to decide. We normally give 150 uh, milligrams starting in the first trimester, but there are various countries have different uh, ways of screening, UK uh, and everything. But I think the Fetal Med Medicine Foundation screening is the best. And they recommend 150 milligrams of aspirin. <clears throat> if you cannot see the cervix by the abdominal route, Make sure your ultrasonologist has seen it by the vaginal route. Whichever route you see, you have to see because it's very important to see the length of the cervix. And then obstetricians must know when to refer in mid-pregnancy. I already talked to you about earlier. So RSI immunization. If there is a titer of 1 in 16, please don't wait. I will monitor till there is high drops. Okay, and congenital torch infections. In my early slides, I said that those who can afford, please get a torch IgG IgM in the first trimester, early first trimester. Not when you detect a congenital malformation, ecogenic bowel in the second trimester, 20 weeks can. If you want to do a torch at 20 weeks, I cannot interpret. Though I've written two books on torch, I cannot interpret because avidity will detect something which has happened only four months before. And then if you have a high avidity, God knows whether it was during the first trimester or one year before the pregnancy, okay? So interpretation becomes difficult if you do tests on the wrong time. Certainly the 18 to 20 week scan, we can do it later now because of the advantage of the MTP Act. We have been doing this for ages now. This was one case that we detected in our center. You know, it was a serenomelia. And it was really a beautiful sight, but of course, not so good for the baby. But it is associated with syndromes. So it's not as simple. So we did a chromosomal microarray. I'm just awaiting the reports. And then the 3D, 4D ultrasound, when you think that there is a problem on 2D, and just look at this, you know, you can actually see the baby with the cleft flip, cleft palate. And it is nowadays becoming a routine to do a genetic scan, in which means you're looking at subtle changes, not very gross abnormalities, but very subtle abnormalities or presence or absence of some markers, which could point towards a chromosomal abnormality. And these are some of the list, I will talk to you in the next slide. Pyelectasis, single amylacal artery, ecogenic bowel, and um, increased nuchal fold thickness. And this is the important slide. So what happens if there is an ecogenic focus? Well, there is an increased risk, which is called the likelihood ratio. So obstetricians, I'm sure you will find it very difficult to do this too digest this slide. So let a fetal medicine specialist help you to calculate the risk. To calculate the risk and to decide ultimately whether to do an amniocentesis or not. Whether to do an amniocentesis or an NIPT or not do anything. These are some tables which I just put here to show that if there is a ecogenic focus, then it could be 
See, it could even be there in three to five percent of chromosomes in normal babies. Okay, and then there we have an in range of likelihood ratios, and then of course the management will differ according to which defect is present: single umbilical artery, short and long bones, absent or hypoplastic bone is a very strong marker. So this is a report which I just recently took out from our uh, uh, our uh, software where there was nephrosis, mild hydronephrosis, there was hypoplastic nasal bone. And when we added them to the computer uh, software, which is we follow the Fetal Medicine Foundation software, the risk increased. So you know now that if the risk is high risk, oh, I need to do an amniocentesis. Or if the risk, risk is low, I can manage with an NIPT. If you find major malformations, again, not all major malformations are associated with chromosomal abnormalities. There could be two types of defects in a baby, chromosomal abnormality or structural abnormality without a chromosomal abnormality. You obstetricians must understand that. So there are some anomalies which are associated with chromosomal abnormalities. So you will have to do an amniocentesis or or today I got a report that how can I do amniocentesis? There is no Lyca. Well, CVS, cord blood sampling, we can we should do. And then the test, you know, very important for counseling. The standard test that we do, culture, we can look at by when we do the karyotype, the major chromal abnormalities. But if you do a chromosomal microarray, you can detect submicroscopic anomalies and even gene defects, you know? So it's like, as uh, Dr. Aishivamba, you say, that it's like looking, culture is looking at a low power microscope, whereas chromosomal uh, uh, microarray, you're looking through a higher or even an electronic microscope. This is the picture of a fluorescent in situ hybridization. You can see three thirteens, Trisomy 13, and this is a karyotype where which uh, looks at all the major chromosomes and deletions. And now a very a favorite topic of mine, the congenital infections, which though we don't have here in data, whenever you find in the second trimester there is an echogenic bowel, or you find that there is a mild ventriculomegaly, then you go scurrying around trying to find out whether it was an infection whether it is an infection. Because though the mother may be asymptomatic, the symptoms in the child, in the baby, can be terrible. So then comes tertiary prevention by actually doing the diagnosis, uh, uh, second, still secondary, by amniocentesis or by corian villa sampling. Or here you can see the <clears throat> needle going on inside the placenta here. This is a 11 weeks pregnancy. And this is what the severe, uh, the Korean virus looks like. So the indications mostly are karyotype now in the first trimester we do when we have a positive aneuploidy screen or you look for genetic disorders. And of course, we can do a cord blood sampling, especially if it is a late pregnancy, malformation, oligohydramnios, RH immunizations, and so on. Again, this was one of our case just to illustrate absolutely no Lyca. And I did a cord blood sampling, and this is a report. It was cytomegalovirus PCR positive. There was no possibility of doing a maternal torch test, you know, because I wouldn't be able to interpret. But I thought that this was very, very, the ultrasound picture was so suggestive of a, a CMV infection <clears throat> that I straight away did a cord blood sampling, sent the torch PCR along with the karyotype and the torch PCR came positive. So at least we know our diagnosis is made. And then I, it becomes easy for us to counsel and prevent in the next pregnancy. So it's very, very important. So uh, these are the various conditions we can diagnose, you know, mental reduction, Down syndrome, 10 weeks onwards. So we shift to an early diagnosis rather than a second trimester diagnosis. 
And finally, two minutes for a tertiary prevention because this is an obstetric group. And this is by the fetal medicine specialist. Refer on time. Again, I'm repeating. And uh, I really thank Professor Kipros Nicolaides with whom I had a fellowship program at uh, Fetal Medicine Foundation London. <clears throat> If you find that the, uh, the uh, malformation is incompatible with life, severe handicap, termination of pregnancy, and now we can terminate a pregnancy even at 39 weeks. In fact, I even saw Dr. Uh, Kipros putting in potassium chloride for a termination in a 39 week fetus. You know, where somehow referred from a, a other country you know, in London, and uh, the mother was already 39 weeks pregnant, but diagnosis of Downs was made. So potassium chloride was instilled into the heart. And uh, that was how a selective, that was how a termination of pregnancy can be done now in our country. If you find that uh, you can correct around the time of, you know, after birth, neonatologists can do the surgery. That's okay. But one group of patients, fetuses, if you don't intervene in utero, the organ will get damaged. And here we have, we come in fetal medicine specialists for fetal therapy, which could be medical or surgical. So we can give transfusion to the uh, fetuses. I think a lot of you in, your, in the 90s, 20s, 2010, on, you had been sending me patients of recess isomalization. I had done more than 1,000 in 2015, which was reported in the newspaper. And it is very, very successful in preventing the stillbirth. Obstructive uropathy, we can put in a shunt, though it's getting controversial now. And then twins, you know, twin-twin transfusion syndrome. We can do fetal endoscopy. Again, I went to Nicolaides for my endoscopy training in 2010, fetal endoscopy, and we started the facility at Ames uh, on my return. So. This will help us to save both babies. <clears throat> this was some of uh, a condition, you know, this is a stuck twin and the other one has polyhydramnios. So we lasered the placenta, vaporized, laser vaporization and saved both the babies. Again, uh, here you can see very clearly twins, monochorionic twins, okay? If they are dichorionic, there's no problem. You just put in KCL, and the baby with the ventriculomegaly, you stop the heart. But what do you do when there is a structural defect in monochorionic twins? You can't put KCL because one baby, if you do, the other one will also conk off. So here is a different technique. Ultrasound gui bi guided bipolar cord coagulation. You coagulate the cord of this fetus with the hydrocephalus. So this would prevent the birth of this baby with the handicap. So tertiary prevention has a big role in today's uh, era. So this is a, a video. You can see the fetal heart activity here, and this is the fetus with the hydrocephalus. So we are putting in this bipolar cautery. You can see it entering. We are going to go to the cord, catch hold of the cord, just like you know in earlier days we used to do ligation with cautery, and now we have caught the cord. We're putting in the current, coagulating the current, uh, the cord, and you can see the heart bradycardia occurring, and well, it stopped. Okay, so you have done a different type of a selective fetal reduction IUD. You've caused the heart to stop, and the other one is living. You couldn't have put in KCL. So these things need a lot of expertise, a lot of training. <clears throat> Research is going on on how you can even treat spina bifida by fetoscopic surgery. I tried to do that, you know, after my training, but no mother was willing. And lastly, we have in our armamentarium pre-implantation genetic diagnosis. In a fertile human, a woman, you do IVF, get seven to 10 embryos, do the embryo testing for aneuploidy, for thalassemia, for whatever test you want, and put back only the healthy embryo so that you don't have to do amniocebius. Thank you very much.
I work here in global ultrasound at Dwarka, global ultrasound and fetal medicine Dwarka. And uh, thanks a lot. Thank you so much, Deepika, ma'am. The talk was just wow. I will request our experts to please give their comments. Dr. Radhika, ma'am, please. So uh, that was a fantastic talk, Dr. Deepika. And I think uh, the, there is only one expert here, and that's Dr. Deepika Deka. So we are here to learn. And of course, uh, it's an ever-learning exercise. And uh, I think starting from the basics, going on to the advanced procedures, I think it was a very informative procedure, Dr. Deepika. Uh, nice listening to you after so many years yet again. Very nice. So. Uh, I think very important points have been highlighted, starting with the history taking for an obstetrician. The family history is so extremely important. Drawing that pedigree chart, which is so simple, which every postgraduate should know as a uh, you know a basic thing. I think that's extremely important, very well highlighted. And uh, you know the various levels of prevention, the primary, secondary, and what can be done at the tertiary level. And uh, I think uh, what you stressed about the RH isomerization. Tell us before the hydrox develops. I think very, very important. So earlier the better, more than one in 16 is a good idea to refer and refer in time. And uh, I think a lot of clarity uh, was thrown uh, in the direction of NIPT because today everybody is rushing, uh, you know, to get the NIPT and talk to the patients, I think. Uh, and it's, it's a large part of it could also be company driven and here is uh, uh, one person with experience who is, uh, you know, giving us the right uh, ideas. And I think uh, that, that very well placed. I and, purposely uh, put in so many slides, you know, yeah. so that it, <laughs> it really... I think it's, it was extremely important. Uh -huh. And uh, another thing that was so very important was that not all structural anomalies are associated with chromosomal abnormalities. And that slide, which showed the ones, the cystic hygroma maximum... Whereas hydrocephalus, hardly, 3 to 4%. I think every gynecologist should be aware of that. And uh, while one is talking to the parents, because it's, you know, what's happened in the present pregnancy, people are worried after all for the next pregnancy. So these are very important counseling points by, uh, you know, for, for the gynecologist. So uh, I think uh, these have been uh, very important highlights. And of course, the last few slides showing the intervention and the, the videos with the intervention procedures were extremely interesting, very informative. So thank you so much, Dr. Deepika. Thank you. We have Dr. Arun Arora, sir, also as the expert. If you, we can have his comments also. Thank you, madam. Excellent presentation, madam. I think that will be some disturbance in the market. Uh, one thing that Dr. Deepika mentioned was a uh, you know, case yesterday, you know, some video making, getting viral. In fact, in that particular patient, it has some inflammation. Uh, all the antenatal, uh, you know, screening profile was normal. Even NT and NTNB was normal. Like whatever tests were done, they were all normal. And later on, after delivery, the you know baby developed. Maybe maybe uh, you know the sensitivity and the specificity of the particular investigations were at trouble. That is part one. So in those patients, it really it really becomes difficult, you know, to to satisfy yourself as well as the patient and everything when everything and the second part the uh, the stillbirth which usually happen in the last trimester or last two weeks we thought that all all patients should have a vaginal delivery somehow you know gets does not get into my head because the government is always looking for you know the after doctors that most cesareans are being done but uh, but uh, Somehow I slightly differ that you know, if more cesarean means uh, less of uh, stillbirth and less of uh, neonatal mortality, uh, things should be okay. And uh, one thing is I think, you know, uh, weird thought of it. Is, uh, can we do something or uh, uh, like can we modify some epigenetic factors? which can prevent uh, uh, as a primary prevention, can, which can prevent uh, fetal defects, or can we uh, modify some genetic uh, 
parameters or profiles by modifying our epigenetic factors? Um, basically, you know, we know that we are folic acid we are using for, uh, yeah, uh, that. but prevention okay. is that you can screen for thalassemia, genetic disorders before pregnancy, before planning the pregnancy. Like, uh, let me tell you, uh, I'm from Assam and I have hemoglobin E disease. My son also has hemoglobin E disease. He's uh, homozygous E. So when he married a Punjabi girl, his classmate, the first thing I did was test her thalassemia. Right. You know, status. Uh, so that I know. Um, uh, so these testings are very, very important. There should be yes. sort of nationwide uh, strategies and about testing for genetic disorders. We are doing it for sickle cell. A day will come, we do it for thalassemia and maybe for other conditions. My pointer probably was, Madam, towards uh, something like called as uh, holistic medicine. Uh, can certain, uh, you know, manuals or certain things, can they really prepare our genetic pool, which is a good pool, so we don't get into, you know, all these things. Maybe, maybe we think of probably meditation or prayers or whatever, all those epigenetic facts, they, they, they definitely have their influence, you know. Yeah, uh, they might influence the environmental factors, but I don't think they can influence genetic factors. No, they, if they act as... Uh, uh, epigenetic factors, even for folic acid also, madam, folic acid, like we are giving, say, three months prior to uh, the, uh, you know, preconception, like three months prior to, and there probably, again, it is not directly acting to, on the neurotube defect and uh, preventing it. Probably it is acting as a, fol as a methyl donor and, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, making a good genetic uh, embryo or like uh, uh, the, uh, like uh, Gametes. This is probably one of the thoughts I always yeah, have. Uh, uh, yeah, there is a lot of research now about the male factor. You know, the male factor, the DNA fragmentation, and uh, DNA fragmentation has been associated with malformations, repeated fetal losses. And so giving antioxidants to the uh, husbands. There's a lot of literature, I was also doing that, has improved the quality of the embryo. Yes, madam. <clears throat> Probably well, that, that's what I said. We are thought maybe uh, some prayers or meditation or stress relieving factors. Yeah, I'm can... sure these all these things can improve the DNA quality of the sperm and maybe the ovum also. Yes, we we, we really need to do research on that. Yeah, that was the thought basically. Thank yeah, you very much. Yes, yes. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. We have Dr. Meenu Vesh also with us. If she's here, we are looking for her comments. I think she's not here. So we start from the audience. Uh, actually, uh, good evening, uh, ma'am. Deepika, ma'am, uh, amazing uh, presentation. I want to ask one question. That when a uh, nasal bone is absent, is there any role of biochemistry for straightforward amniocentesis? This is my question. Um, you are, can you introduce Dr. yourself? Sangeeta, Dr. Sangeeta Pawa from Amritsar. You're, you're an obstetrician or? Yeah, I am obstetrician. Okay. Doctor, I can just tell you one thing. Please, obstetricians, don't take a decision. Refer. You know, it is not something that I can talk to you just now. I have to look at the patient's profile. I have to look, starting from the family history, I have to look at her um, age, her dual marker, the ultrasound, other features, and then only I will do the risk calculation, and then only can I uh, counsel her whether she needs. So this is what I'm trying to say. There are a lot of obstetricians, you know, are trying to take the decision themselves. You people are so busy. You have placenta accretors. You have, uh, I don't know what not. No, uh, but actually, I want to ask that. Uh, if we are going no, to it is not a test. simple answer. It is not two plus two is equal okay. to four. Okay. okay. It is two plus two equal to yeah. minus one or minus ten. Also. Okay. You know. There, there are so many ifs and buts cannot be done in a webinar like this. It cannot be discussed in a WhatsApp. I get this type of request every day on my WhatsApp. It's better that I uh, see the patient, take a history. Otherwise, the counseling will be totally wrong. Ma'am, uh, good evening, ma'am. One more question. 
suppose introduce patient, yourself i would like to know who ma'am deepti sharma deepti sharma and dr deepti sharma from narora district blind share uttar pradesh ma'am suppose the person gets a ntnp scan done at 13 plus 5 weeks or 4 weeks yeah uh, 13 weeks plus 3 4 days and uh, okay. her door marker cannot be done why not this, why not ma'am uh, door marker is up to like uh, 12 weeks by day yeah, 13 uh, weeks 13 either weeks. you do the door marker earlier but uh, you know if they have not done at the time do it now accuracy may be a little okay. affected but do it okay ma'am can can we do nipt instead of door marker uh see again i'm saying that uh, <laughs> <laughs> and i pretty has just different uses and dual marker has its different uh, interpretations ji yeah, ma'am okay uh, and i pretty cannot pick up some things like triploidy okay, okay. which are not so uncommon so uh, dual marker can also pick up other things like the risk for preeclampsia iugr you know yes ma'am ah uh, so it's better that you do the dual marker and then the standard should be dual marker and ntnb scan ntnb scan after that you decide whether you need an nipt or an amniocentesis or whatever okay okay thank you i think uh, dr deka is on a mission you know when she wants to teach all obstetricians uh, practicing in this country when to refer that is what is important yes, and the sir. basics you you should not aim to become fetal medicine expert We do not have medicine expert. Few are enough, but you must send them in time. She had given a couple of tips this time, and if you want to really do a torch, it should be done in the right in the first trimester. In second trimester, you will not be able to do it. You have to counsel your patient when she comes to your first visit that your dual marker will be done at twelve weeks with a lung with ultrasound. So at least she knows everything yeah. about it. And I think you know, just reading final report. Uh, that this is uh, high risk and this is low risk. I think you should re read between the lines also what is beta HCG report, Absolutely. what is FAFA report. That particular interpretation yes. is expected from you because unless you know that, you will not be able to refer in time. Yes, yes, ma'am. I, I want all obstetricians to know the basics. Good evening, Deepika, ma'am. Yeah, uh, who's this there? Is, uh, this is this is Mridula from Bareilly, ma'am. Oh, hi, Mridula. After ages. Yes, ma'am, and it was lovely to hear your talk. It's always, always so much enriching. I have only one question, ma'am. Uh, suppose we have a patient of RPL. When is the right time to send her to you? She's. Ha before I have the next pregnancy. Before the next pregnancy, how many yes. weeks, months after her uh, present pregnancy loss? After six weeks. Six weeks. Okay, ma'am. Yeah, after six weeks. and you know i would say that um, uh, uh, since everybody is here that in rpl please send the products of conception for chromosomal microarray and this products of conception don't do a suction if you can do medical abortion because you know in medical abortion what happens is the fetus comes out literally in toto and then yes, you can you know you use two rs forceps so you use two tissue forceps and dissect out the villi or you can if the fetus is a big one you can take out the uh, skin you can take the skin and should be some micro microarray and that will rule out and then you don't have to do immunological tests and this and that if there is a chromosomal problem and ma'am should be the new directions by ishri should be send in normal saline only yes normal saline you can send in formalin oh no not formalin some uh, we were also being told that a drop of gentamicin should be added oh yeah you can add in a drop of gentamicin okay give it a, keep it in a clean container sterile urine um, you know collection bottles tube ji ma'am uh, doctors are very confused about the karyotyping of products of conception or a microarray once products of conceptions you know they are out from the uterus and if they are dead the uh, karyotyping is not possible karyotyping no. is only possible on a dividing cell So you have to send it for microarray. Otherwise, it will not be useful. Yes, ma'am. That's what we are asking for microarray. Yeah. What I mean is, do the microarray. Don't just yes. uh, you know not do anything. Right, ma'am. Thank you so much, ma'am. So And can I just see her? We hope to see you, ma'am, in Bareilly in twenty four. We are having UPCOG. Bareilly is hosting it. Yeah, I love. I Adam, remember once. Madam Pradula, we we hope to see you on the eighteenth of uh, June in Delhi. 
before that you want to see uh, dr deka ma'am i'm trying to... I can I just uh, uh, yes bridula please come things we need yes, yes i remember having such a wonderful time with you <laughs> thank you ma'am i just wanted to thank dr deepika for honoring us you know and sharing her vast knowledge with us such a short time each slide was priceless each message was so clear such a wonderful orator and you know all that knowledge that you have gained over the years we i just thought it was like a small book on you know fetal medicine made easy something like that wonderful i'm writing a book by the way i'm writing a book on prevention of birth defects so we are looking forward to it thank you so much dr deka i have time on my hands now <laughs> not going for delivery Thank you so much. Can I ask a question? Um, I'm keen, Doctor Anita from Delhi. Thank you. Yes, sure. I think we are running short of time. We are running short of time, ma'am. So they told I go go the flight. Ah, uh, thank you. Uh, I just wish to communicate to everyone that Doctor Deepika Deka is has volunteered herself. Her vision is so great for carrying the program for the prevention of birth defect on the forum of North India Gynae Forum as well. So. All the people from all seven states of North India, we look forward to visiting them and there. So it was wonderful. Uh, yeah, I but you like haven't officially okayed it, Doctor Sadna. You have not officially okayed it. He has published it publicly. Announced it just now. Okay, <laughs> I'll go ahead. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair and Doctor Sadna. Everybody. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Deepika, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Samkin, ma'am, can we proceed with the panel discussion, please? Yes, sure. So we start with the session two, a panel discussion on people's perceptions for prevention of a stillbirth, confusion to clarity. For the panel discussion, I hand over the mic and the stage to Dr. Shaila Jamal, who is a public awareness committee member of SBSI. a youth mentor and the founder president of smdhm society of menstrual disorder and hygiene management a society very close to our hearts she has already been introduced by tamkin ma'am but let me introduce her further she is the associate professor at rmri bareilly a menstrual health specialist has a number of awards award of honor by who award of excellence in mhm foxy leaders of tomorrow foxy mr shelja pandit award and prashasti patra by government of up she is an uh, medical education unit coordinator and has edited and reviewed various journals welcome dr shela kya yaar ye raste mein kyon khadi kar di hai can i share my screen please Okay. Before that, uh, we welcome all on this unique platform, joining of two big hands for this very uh, reason that was required. That is, spreading public awareness about prevention of stillbirth. So, I would like to thank uh, Tamkin, ma'am, for this opportunity. Sadna, ma'am, for organizing everything. However high she has reached, still her groundwork is unmatchable. and with that i would like to thank with folded hands sharda ma'am also ma'am uh, you are guiding us you are our guiding angel spreading light of knowledge wisdom and uh, thank you so much for uh, showing us the path always today and tomorrow so dr apurva you need to tell me whether my slides are visible or not yes visible 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 So slide show is going on? No, ma'am, not in the slide show mode. Just a second. Now? It is. Okay. Thank you so much. So, uh, Sadna, ma'am, she uh, since she has just boarded the flight, so it might not be possible for her. And with that, I am bestowed upon a heavy responsibility. So. uh i'm sure uh, uh, expert comments and inputs by sharda ma'am and tanki ma'am and deepika ma'am as yet she is sitting over here will help us tight through this uh, topic which again is very important in the light of public awareness 
So the panel of faculty that we have today, and we are honored to have them, Dr. Savita Tyagi, Dr. Neelima Yadav, Dr. Preeti Gaur, Dr. Sangeeta Bhava, Dr. Darak Shabas, and Dr. Naima Afreen, experts in their own way, and here they are to tell about further divisions and confusions. So since 2000, let's have a look at just these 22, uh, 23 years that we have been venturing through uh, since the start of this century, an estimate of around 20 million uh, babies have been stillborn. Stillbirth is a huge burden globally. Every 73rd birth ending in a stillbirth, almost eight in 10 occur in Sub-Saharan, African and Southern Asia. Over 40% occur during labor. Majority can be prevented through quality care during pregnancy and at birth. COVID-19 has taken a huge toll and we have to bridge the gap as yet. And if the current trends are continuing and investments are not accelerated, we are yet to see another 16 million babies by the time this decade ends. In 2021, about half of all stillbirths occur in six countries, India, Pakistan, Nigeria, and Democratic Republic of the Congo, Ethiopia, and Bangladesh. And in order of burden, highest to lowest, we rank number one. So people's perception, we all know in some cultures, stillbirths are perceived as mother's faults, resulting in public shaming or individual feeling of guilt or shame that prevents public mourning of their low loss. The lack of opportunity to publicly grieve can cause stillbirths to be considered as non-events. Such social taboos, stigmas, and misconceptions often silence families or impact the recognition and grieving of stillbirths contributing to, to their invisibility. That often means that bereaved parents are left with unanswered questions and unaddressed grief. For addressing the grief part, uh, we would like to uh, take permission from Tamkeen Ma'am for giving another webinar to us. But today we are here to talk about the unanswered question. Because awareness regarding stillbirth, all said and done, is still low. Everyone wants a rosy picture to be painted and social stigma, shub shub bolo, still birth ki baati ki koi niya, bacha peet mein mar jaye ga ya chances hai marne ke, we are not, you know, allowed to talk or think even. And all said and done with this also, there is confusion amongst clinicians. With confusion, I don't mean to say there is lack of knowledge, but yes, the rose is red, the, this is beautiful rose red, this is beautifully smelling rose red. All perceptions are different, but we are talking of one thing. So let's clear them all. Causes may be from low antenatal care supervision, ranging to facility, to the part of caregiver, but there are certain things that we as yet do not know. So we have to explore these less talked realms because all of them, uh, them will form modifiable factors, as was one of those factors talked about just by Deepika ma'am we can modify this factor of uh, congenital anomalies to prevent stillbirth rates. So confusion to clarity, we know about cords, we know about fetal kick count, we know about sleep pattern, food, exercise, but are we clear? So let us see. This cord, cord connect. So the first case goes like that, a 32 years second gravida, para one, Life zero, she is coming to our antenatal care at 39 weeks, two days. She has an ultrasound report showing nuchal cord. Her booking obstetrician advice is given to her. She had a previous vaginal delivery seven years back, but baby died at three years of age for unidentified reasons. The patient was not clear why the baby died. So my question to Dr. Savita Tyagi, madam, what will your opinion be in this scenario? Savita ma'am is here. Uh, doctor, please, uh, you have to, Dr. Savita, unmute yourself, please. Yeah. Yes, I will uh, like to know whether she had gone for color Doppler also or not. And uh, what is the weight of the baby at this moment? And if any associated factor like uh, any, uh, what is the AFI, what is color Doppler uh, readings for her? Then I will decide whether I should go straight for, for the cesarean or I should go for the normal. If all the things are normal and there is no sign of any distress, then I will go for intrapartum monitoring with the CTG and let her go for the normal labor. It's my opinion. Okay, ma'am. So my question to you over here is, how will the color Doppler help in this particular scenario? 
because if it is the short cord and it is around the neck, then chances of hypo uh, hypoxia are more. And if it is there, short cord around the, it is tight, then there will be, uh, it will be pressing the umbilical vein. So there will be hypovolemia, hypo and hypoxia. They, that will, there will be changes in all the parameters of the color Doppler. Like so, uterine artery, middle cerebral artery, parameters PI and RI. Okay. So uh, a comment by uh, Sharda ma'am over here. See, many times we get the cord around the neck and uh, ultrasonologists mentioned that it is loose or not. Madam has made the right thing. But one thing one, one must remember that this, does, this patient does not have a live child. And if you find that all parameters for a normal delivery are very easy, then you should go ahead with the close monitoring and proper counseling. That any moment during labor, the chances of if you have the fetal heart goes, you know, increase or decrease or irregular, we will take her for cesarean section. This counseling has to be with her. If the counseling is with her and those people are ready and you also find it's going to be an easy delivery, you can go ahead with easy delivery. But sometimes you find in such cases, there is so much of a family pressure on the gynecologist. And we don't want to take a chance. Then you have no other option. This is we find her day in, day out. But at the same time, if she is absolutely easy vaginal delivery, you're expecting with a close monitoring, with proper counseling, she can be kept for vaginal delivery. So these are always the uh, sweating part while a case for obstetricians to do or not to do. This is there is always a dilemma. And you have very rightly uh, guided us, ma'am, that counseling is very important. Here, I would like to uh, uh, ask for a comment from Tamki, ma'am, also. So cord around the neck is normally there in one fourth of cases, 25%. It may be once, twice, four times. It is not an indication for cesarean section, but definitely like Dr. Shada said, you have to consider the case in total. Also, uh, the, the frame of mind that the people are in, the family is in. And you have to do a proper counseling, reassure them that it is not an indication for cesarean. It is only an indication for closer monitoring both during labor and even without labor. Okay, so uh, excellent points. But uh, for the ease of observations that all of us are sitting over here, how will we reassure ourselves whether we are going to land in more trouble or not? There is a sign known as divert sign. It is a circular indentation of the fetal nuchal skin seen on ultrasound. With a simple ultrasound probe, if the compression of fetal neck by USG elicits fetal heart rate decelerations, it can predict intrapartum, adverse intrapartum cord events very nicely. In fact, in a very large study which was published in 2018 by Mendes Bauer et al., they predicted 82.3 sensitivity and 89.1% specificity for predicting perinatal uh, adverse events, especially asphyxia. They found a high correlation with intrapartum stillbirth if divert sign was positive also. So as Tamkin ma'am has very, very rightly said, this is an indication for close intrapartum monitoring, not cesarean delivery per se, but as a obstetrician, we will be more alert if we are able to see this. As uh, uh, Sangeeta ma'am was talking about uh, uh, cord around neck, this is a syndrome, an identified syndrome where cord becomes wrapped around the fetal neck for around 360 degrees. Now, one point of content over here, because many a times a radiologist is just looking at the cord. If Even if the cord is just overriding the neck, they are reporting it as cord around neck. They have to look in the entirety, whether it is wrapping in the uh, entirety of the neck, then only they have to report it as cord around neck. They're very common, single cords are more common. And the incidence is increasing with the advancing gestational age. In my own paper, uh, which was published when I was an academic baby, uh, we predicted prolonged second stage of labor, third degree perineal tear, shoulder dystocia, quite often with cord around neck and 12% rate of stillbirth in our own, at our own center. So along with this, it is important to talk about TCAN syndrome also. When the cord is tightly wrapped, as uh, I think Sharda Mem was talking about, the cluster of cardiorespiratory and neurological signs and symptoms associated with this unique physical feature that is secondary to cord round, uh, tight cord round neck is being referred to as TCAN syndrome. So we have to be aware about this. The baby looks like this. This is not a stillbirth baby, but this was a baby which was delivered 
when the uh, cord was tightly wrapped around the neck. It shows features of hypovolemia, acidosis, and infants may have facial, neck, and upper torso petechiae also. So this is different from hypoxia due to uteroplacental insufficiency. There goes now, uteroplacental efficiency will be very efficiently predicted and diagnosed by color doctor. But this cord around neck syndrome will not be very nicely predicted by color doctor because hypoxia due to UPI is due to uh, this uh, inadequate transfer from the placenta to the fetus. And in this case where cord is entangled, there is decreased flow back from the fetus to the placenta, thus it is causing congestion. So the features are visible, features are evident. Now, Sharda ma'am, just one word more from you over here for this case. What is the importance of placental interrogation? We have had multiple webinars over this. Dr. Sunil has been talking about this. So ma'am, uh, your uh, views over this, please. In any case, uh, placenta has to be really screened properly and you must see what is the relative size of the placenta in comparison to the baby. You find things are smaller then you can then send it. But cord and placenta in relation, they will have some specific relation because this cord is around the neck. I think I, I do not know anything about it. So I was also, uh, I'm, I'm looking for this and I found this uh, literature that when we are looking for placenta histopathology and fetal thrombotic vasculopathy, thrombosis seems to be highly specific for cord related stillbirth. And Dumkin, ma'am, uh, your comments over this. Yes, it has to be documented in order to attribute it as the cause of death in a stillbirth. It so, has to be present, yeah. Yeah. So uh, when we are talking about cord, Dr. Neelima Yadav, we cannot leave this topic untouched. That is umbilical cord coiling index. Much talk Am about I audible to say that? Yes, Sadhana ma'am. Am I audible to say that? Uh, yes. One thing, just uh, a wonderful uh, panel, Sela, first of all, a hearty thanks for going all the things with my all five. One thing which we say that uh, all uh, uh, association which are working for prevention of still, but says, though we find the cord accident as a probable cause, but it should not be taken always. Always the cause analysis should be done. And we cannot take that this is still, but was only due to the cord accident like the loyal cooling. So this was my way and I think Dr. Sharda Jain and Dr. Tamkin also said same thing that the placental histopathology and other cause analysis should be done. Labor Dr. Sarna, let me be very clear. Before this lady goes into labor, she has been told by the ultrasonologist that the cord is around the neck. They're concerned about it. They come to you and then you tell that, you know, she has had an easy vagina delivery. Also this time she can have easy vagina delivery. We have absolutely everything with the monitor. But you know, you should be prepared any time when we ask for cesarean section, you should be prepared for that. If you're not prepared, then you do what you want. But I, th I find, you know, in, in city of Delhi, there is so much of pressure. If the child is not alive with them, docs up, go for elective. As if elective cesarean section is uh, the answer for everything. Dr. Uh, Tamkin, what is you have to say? You're still working in a medical college. I've come out from the medical college and I am in the private sector. Yeah, we are not. Still birth is not acceptable. One thing is clear: still birth is not acceptable. Explanation can yes. go in four walls of medical college, but majority of the people who are listening are private practitioners. So your very balanced uh, thing should come from you. Yes, I am. Um, as I said, that one fourth of twenty-five percent of all women they will have cord around the neck. It is not an indication for cesarean section. It is only an indication for closer monitoring. And what I counsel my patients when they are worried, I say ki. The way it has become coiled 360 degrees, it can also uncoil the same way. It keeps on happening throughout, you know, the intrauterine life. But yes, if in labor, and now a lot of, you know, uh, ultrasound in la during labor is coming up. So I think that could be a useful uh, tool during labor. Uh, like Shella said, uh, doing that sign. Uh, uh, sign. Yeah, that sign, yeah. Dr. Tumkin, this is all theoretical. 2% of the gynecologists know how to do an ultrasound. What about 98%? You are, I, 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 I really stand corrected. You're absolutely right. Hindustan ki baat karni hai na, we don't want to talk of anything else. Hamare Hindustan ke 2% logo ko gynecologists ko ultrasound karna aata hai. Hum, meri boss, jo Delhi gynecologist forum ke, unho ne ka, Dr. Jain, 
जब ये दस परसेंट होगा तब मुझे बताइएगा दस परसेंट तो मेरी जिंदगी में तो कभी होने वाला नहीं है यू एब्सोल्युटली राइट यू एब्सोल्युटली राइट सो गोइंग ऑन द प्रिकॉशनरी साइड इज ऑलवेज बेटर सो मे आई जस्ट इंटरप्ट हियर इफ यू डोंट माइंड यस मैम um i think all the medical colleges have ultrasound machines and i think all the post graduates anyone doing md should be able to do ultrasound doctor the doctor the, they got this is only possible in all indian institute of medical sciences oh ma'am even the even the faculty members do not know i'm trying to tell you very uh, frankly but we should change that mindset every medical college has ultrasound machine why can't the faculty learn how to do the pg should be able to do If the fault is with the medical colleges they are not training md uh, ms uh, gynecologists in ultrasound madam i think this is away from the uh, medical uh, uh, this discussion of this panel we can talk yeah, later know, but, but the uh, deficiency I, I know, is just, you know people who are sitting in apex institute cannot imagine what is happening in lady harding medical college till the time i left lady harding medical college the antenatal care means only hemoglobin urine test and the blood group even for viral markers we had to rugby we have come a long way but i think what is happening in all indian institute of medical sciences does no, not no. happen in the periphery uh, madam i think now things are much better every medical college has ultrasounds no man we are, we are having ultrasound in the medical college i am working as professor and head in srd medical college even then sharda ma'am has rightly said we are not able to teach our pgs when we ourselves are not not confident then you know you should get the training the market was a senior resident from the institutions of the trainees must learn how to do ultrasound it's not very yes, from from where from our, our pgs of the radiology department and from the senior resident but they are not coming in our how department. did the radiologists learn, learn in the first place okay doctor okay, ekpa the no, doctor deka here i train people in ivf infertility i also i also train them that you learn transvaginal sonography and how to do reporting how to interpret reporting this is what i want to teach but i'm yes. telling you all my people do not know at ultrasound and how can you come for infertility and ivf training when you do not know uh, how to do transvaginal sonography this is the picture of the country but uh, madam when i was in aims i used to do training and i always used to invite professors only from medical colleges for workshops and they used to follow me around you know for one month they used to go back i used to ask them why aren't you doing bolte we are not confident not only in the practice madam it is individual ab to digital ka time ho gaya we can find out how many people know ultrasound how many people do not know but yes if an ultrasound machine is there you can definitely do whether it is head or not or is a breach or head to pata kar loge ye jo madam ne itne sign bataye divot sign i am hearing for the first time डॉक्टर डॉक्टर लेना बहुत बड़ी बात है। Yeah, can i just add something i think dr deka is always aspiring for you know perfection the ideal situation and we should all be working towards it but what dr sharda said is absolutely true the professors in the medical colleges also do not know how to do a proper a, a, an ultrasound and oh, more yeah. you know the the dr deka the thing is that we are overloaded with work sometimes that is also one of the reasons yeah i think that's the, the main OPD, of 200 patients it is not i think easy to do the ultrasound ourselves so that is also sometimes one of the reasons but you know ultrasound maybe like what you are saying doing a pv one day is it not doing a pv madam do mai private sector mein hu pichle 30 saalon se kitne ultrasonologists kitne gynecologists ke paas labor room mein ultrasound machine hai not even 1 or 2% dr deka reality mein wo mtp act ke wajah se i mean pcp entity act ke wajah se bahut pareshani ho rahi hai So there are a lot of factors, yeah. but the go ahead. Let's, go ahead. Uh, let's keep it simple. Yes, yes. <laughs> like Dr. Shatter said. Yes. But it was so, very interesting to know about the divot sign. I think that should be very useful during labor. But again, we but should have. But uh, I would like to highlight then, yeah. here is okay. that radiologist is doing the divot sign. When they are identifying cord around neck, they can tell us about divot sign also. 
so that was one thing and that is very simple to do also we can train and now competency based medical education we are training our post graduates where the sending them to radiology department to learn the basics of ultrasound but yes as sharda ma'am said this is again a far fetched dream and we have to work more for it so uh, coming to you dr neelima yadav ma'am what is umbilical cord coiling index and can it be utilized for predicting stillbirth because we are still stuck on to ultrasound we still have that probe in hand can we do something else also yes actually umbilical cord coiling index is basically is uh, uh, done on ultrasonography antenatally and it can be done postnatally also to retrospectively look for the cause of fetal birth though it is not straight forward related to the cause of fetal birth but it has been seen in the studies that there is high statistics in those uh, babies having the more number of coils to have the chances of fetal birth so this can be uh, utilized as one of the markers to uh, categorize the patient into a high risk one especially those who have already had still births in their previous pregnancies so that we can have a good um, intrapartum monitoring of these patients if they are going for normal deliveries or uh, even if going for cesarean we can plan their cesarean uh, at a appropriate time depending on if they have this also as a factor uh, in their antenatal scenario so if we say um, what is antenatal umbilical cord coiling index this is a number of coils per centimeter of cord so in general if uh, we um, say this is the uh, number of coil uh, uh, normally it is around one coil in 5 cm of cord length and if we calculate it very precisely it comes out to be around 0.17 spiral complete coils uh, per cm so uh, normal range is 0.17 plus minus 0.009 so if uh, 10 to 90% is a normal percentile if less than 10th centile is there then we say this is hypocoiled umbilical cord and if if it is more than 90 centile then it is said as hypercoiled uh, less chances of fetal births are there in cases of hypocoiled but particularly in those cases where the hypercoiling is there the chances of fetal births have been more as compared to hypocoiled umbilical cords and uh, other than the still birth there are more chances of intrauterine growth restrictions preterm births as well as fetal distress and hypoxia so which leads us to go for intrapartum ctg monitoring or strict monitoring to be more vigilant during the labor and uh, if we say talk about the hypocoiled umbilical cord there are uh, some association with trisomies and single single umbilical cords single, single umbilical arteries so if we are seeing the hypocoiled umbilical cord uh, please look for the trisomies and any soft markers for that that though this is quite late to be uh, looking for retrospectively because uh, this index we do either in the second trimester or in the third trimester and what we look for the soft marker or the trisomy markers that is done um, um by the start of the second trimester it is all complete so we cannot extrapolate but at least we can look for the markers so that at the time of some miss happening or the still birth is there we can counsel our patient well that these are the um, some of the indicators that this can happen so the patient can also be more vigilant during her pregnancy she can be there near uh, at a center which has good expertise in uh, monitoring of the labor and uh, should not go to the remote place at last moment so that her labor is labor goes unmonitored or at a less trained hand very true dr yadav actually uh, what we wanted to highlight over here is that there is no need to do umbilical cord coiling index in routine just to yes, justify an answer ki she may have a uh, still birth later on but yes uh, if we see fgr uh, we see previous still births then it is a good idea to go for it at least we can find some indicators for better monitoring as you've already said other uh, research adjuncts are amniotic fluid erythropoietin okay. level index vibroacoustic stimulation the different pattern that a fetus reacts to when we are vibroacoustically stimulating that uh, fetus that is also there in the literature we can utilize it and again mc and umbilical artery resistance index may give us an idea but not to be professed as regular uh, uh, testing for just to reduce uh, 
for uh, uh, reducing the number of stillbirths. So take two practice points over here are cord round neck is associated with no doubt adverse perinatal outcome, but there is no significant association with the stillbirth as yet. Other perinatal events may be more contributory rather and isolated can as an indicator for the elective caesarean is not to be promoted but vigilance during labor should be promoted as was discussed by our experts also. So coming to next important thing, uh, th 24 years, th uh, third gravita previous to abortions comes at 35 weeks with reduced fetal movement perception for last 24 hours. But she is extremely worried about this condition. An NST was done by the obstetrician, which was reassuring. She was sent back. After three days, she comes back with absent fetal movements and ultrasound confirmed fetal demise. So, Dr. Preeti Gaur, my question to you over here is, what could have gone wrong in this patient? Dr. Preeti is here. Yeah. Good evening, all. Yeah, I feel honored to be a part of this panel. So, Dr. Shaila, in this patient at 35 weeks of gestation, and she said 24, the last 24 hours, she didn't perceive the fetal movements. Am I audible? Yes, yes. Yeah. She didn't perceive fetal movements for the last 24 hours. If such a patient reports to us, so we definitely, initially, we have to, uh, like, instead of doing NST, I think had I been there, I would have gone for uh, the pocket Doppler. We would have seen the, uh, done the auscultation for her. And then definitely, immediately, I would have done the ultrasound as well. Because NST may, like, yeah. if in case the NST was reactive, it, did, uh, it showed the accelerations along with the fetal movement. Then, but but uh, along with that, I think an ultrasound with a biophysical profile also should have been done so that we have a more elaborate uh, view of the patient. And uh, at 35 weeks of gestation, uh, uh, unless the ultrasound is done and the CTG also is assuring, both the things, if in case we have to uh, see this patient in total, only then we can uh, we, uh, send the patient back home. We should have definitely kept the patient for observation. Because many things can go wrong. In the ultrasound biophysical profile, when we do, we see the fetal tone, we see the fetal movements, we see the fetal breathing movements, combine it with NST. This is how we interpret the biophysical profile. And if in case that is fine, then maybe we send the patient home, tell her to again uh, keep account of the movements, and then definitely turn uh, come back after 24 hours. This patient didn't report for three days. And when she came after three days, uh, at that time, the uh, fetal damage was diagnosed. So, this is my opinion. Okay. So, uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Basically, uh, our message as Public Awareness Committee of the Stillbirth Society of India, working for reduction of stillbirth when a patient is coming with absent or reduced perception of fetal movements, everything is fine on workup, whatever workup we are doing. We have to tell us about the recurrence of decreased fetal movement. One single episode of a decrease in fetal movement perception does not warrant an That's exhaustive workup like biophysical profile or uh, ultrasound color doctor. As we are well aware that 55%, 30% they are associated with reduced perception of fetal movement. We have ample of data, ample of research for that. But uh, we have to tell them that we need to uh, tell them that you have to be more aware of uh, your fetal movements now. In case there is recurrence of decrease in fetal movements, then that, back up to panel, yeah. yes, that panel has to be done. And you were very right when you said within those 72 hours, God knows what has happened. There were recurrence. Was she able to perceive? Was she aware of that? But yes, uh, uh, that calls for a second uh, visit with the, this patient. I would like to highlight over here about a firm trial, which was the largest trial which uh, has been done in this regard till date. This was a care package based on fetal movement perception and the patient's awareness about that. So although it was said that statistically significant decrease in the number of stillbirth was not there, but absolute numbers were very good and very bright to when tell us to... yeah. aware about her fetal movements. So with that uh, goes the second. Dr. Shaila, can yes. we? Sorry, sorry, sorry to disturb you. Can you ask for opinion, Dr. Sharda and Dr. Deepika are there yes, regarding the you know importance of fetal movement uh, according to their experience? Because definitely after FM trial, everybody is is questioning, and more trials have come in after the FM trial. Uh, yeah. Here, I just must say that we are the old timers, and we definitely believe in fetal movements. 
uh, very consciously around uh, 32, 33 weeks, people like us definitely tell them what about the fetal movements are. And we, I always tell them, the mother knows the best. She's the first one to know. There's something is going wrong to, uh, go, to going to go wrong with the baby. If you find there is something, if you are not perceiving the fetal movements and we tell them, you know, to record uh, post meal one hour and yes. uh, breakfast, lunch and dinner. And if you find one time in the afternoon, you have not heard it. In the evening, again, you have not heard it. This is the time that you don't sit over in the night for 12 hours. You have to go to the services where, where you want it. Because 12 hours, nothing will happen. Only, only after 12 hours, will th uh, will, things will happen. So when you go to the uh, place where you're booked, they will do your NST, they will do your ultrasound. And now in, the, in modern time, even they, if you find there is a, she's a borderline weight or there is a slightly uh, growth retardation, Doppler should be done because Doppler studies will come much before the NST and the fetal movements will be later than that. So I, I think, you know, I give a lot of importance to fetal movements. And uh, in my practice, if you consult these patients well, if you have every weekly you've seen their fetal movements chart, uh, it is very rewarding. I agree with madam. Uh, I also rely, uh, usually rely a lot on the fetal movement count. Uh, another little thing I want to add over here, some patients say that they do not have movements, but when we do the ultrasound, the baby is kicking away. So some of the reasons are that the placenta is anterior or the mm -hmm. woman is uh, a little on the heavier side. So then I, you know, look at the ultrasound, look at the uh, placental area and see where the placenta has finished. And I tell her that you should lie on your side or whichever side, whichever way place. I find that the baby is going to be more in contact with the maternal skin means there is no placenta or the abdominal wall is thinner. And then uh, she should put her hand there and she definitely, then she says, ha, 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 mil rai. You know, so you have to teach them also how to feel the fetal movements. That's so at the right place. Yeah. That's so, beautiful. so there's a term uh, which has come up, uh, mind fetalness. And uh, uh, recent guidelines have also come up. Uh, I think RCOG was the only one providing a guideline what to do with patients reporting with decreased fetal movements. So they have again, you know, uh, uh, renewed those guidelines in May, June 23. I'll share with the group. And uh, another cause that I have found is when they're developing polyhydramnios yeah. and with congenital anomalies. If there's a septum, then as the baby grows, they start saying that I have been, uh, you know, now I'm experiencing lesser fetal movements. Thank you so much for, to the experts. So now moving ahead, yes, Dr. Gaur, uh, what instructions would you give on fetal movements during pregnancy? Because we have been talking about this from your yeah. side. Yeah. In less than 28 weeks of pregnancy, there are a lot of movements. But then there is a plateau at 32 weeks of pregnancy. And that continues. But then again, at term, there are a lot of movements. I would advise my patient just lie on your left uh, left side and at least move the, observe the movements post breakfast for one hour post lunch post dinner and then you should have at least 10 movements in that time if in case that is so then that is fine if still she feels anxious and doesn't perceive movement then we can just advise her to have a bit of snack have some cold juice or something and then again appreciate not to panic for that but definitely they have to keep a track because in case of obesity and as rightly pointed out by Deepika ma'am in anterior placenta, definitely they might not be able to perceive, but then uh, in the, uh, eventually the baby might be fine, but then you can't take it the other way around also. So that either they've observed the Cardiff count to 10, uh, they can have, they, they can just lie down and then observe the fetal movement for two hours. In, the, in these two hours, if the movements are more than 10, then they can be definitely satisfied. So either Cardiff count to 10, or they can have this count from uh, one hour post breakfast, post lunch, post uh, dinner. If these counts are okay, then definitely uh, they can be comfortable. But if in case like they any uh, by, by chance if they feel there's uh, there's any hitch or they are not perceiving normal fetal movements, let them come to the maternity unit. Let them be satisfied. We'll observe them. We'll like uh, see it with the pocket Doppler. We'll have the auscultation. We might do the CTG antenatally at uh, 32, 33 weeks if the patient is. But definitely with that other patient, 35 weeks, uh, in my private practice, I would have kept the patient. I would have admitted the patient. I would not have let her go. Because at 35 weeks, definitely we have to do the uh, CTG also, the ultrasound also, 
the biophysical profile also and the image Doppler also so that we can be satisfied because of the Doppler PI index SD ratios and all are fine. So definitely we can be uh, like uh, 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 satisfied enough that nothing is going to happen for another few days. And definitely that baby would be salvageable. This is my opinion. Okay. But, uh, Dr. Preeti, two hours, nobody is going to record it. If when you once you do post meal, breakfast, and lunch and dinner, agar ek ghante me pehle teen moments aage, to das minute ke baad bhi band kar sakti hai. We don't wait for ten. Okay. Ten is for the whole day. It is ek ghante me pehle teen moments aage, usko bees minute me bhi ho sakti hai, usko pachis minute bhi ho sakti hai. To bhi usko ek ghante baithne ki jarurat hai. Three moments are enough okay. into during that particular hour. Fine, ma'am. Thank you. Yes, okay, ma'am. Yes, ma I was uh, about to ask you: uh, Is there any good method? Any bad method? Do we have any benefits of these methods? As you is has been highlighted, cardiff count to ten, modified cardiff method, count to ten methods. We are old timers, and you know, from nineteen seventies, these particular things had been absolutely highlighted. But what I found in my practice is post meal is the best. Because, you know, once the child gets the food, the child starts jumping. And yes. the movements are so much perceivable uh, after that. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a, a picture with every uh, mother. But the counseling is must. And people like us on our antenatal chart, that monitoring card is there. And she is supposed to show. Okay, then we will see you all the time. We will see you all the time. We will see you all the time. Because in Delhi, one stillbirth means one crore mm -hmm. of rupees. Yes, yes, Very true. Uh, your inputs on this. Benefit unclear? Sorry. See, majority of the time, this particular fetal movements are very well appreciated. Dr. Deepika Deka has uh, already said, and today only I saw that home NST. It is beautiful. You know, this lady there, you get it for 3,000 rupees and everything is recorded and she sends it through uh, the Android phone to the doctor and the doctor can definitely see what is the fetal moments like. I, I'm, I'm sure in the coming years, this, this is going to be very, very easy, especially in high-risk patients. Yes, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, and actually, we have to tell our patients, uh, they have different perception of that. Sleep, their sleep cycle is also very important, you know. Yes. Yeah. Sleep cycle, sleep they cycle must for have, you know, 20. in one hour, if they have not perceived, okay, you know, account mm -hmm. for another hour. And in case if the child is still not making any movements, you should get 90 one. minutes, yeah, 90 minutes. So 90 minutes. So, A child only sleeps for 90 Yes, uh, that should be uh, alerting the physician as well as the patient. That no baby sleeps for more than 90 minutes. If you're not perceiving, at least have a word with your obstetrician over phone or whatever. And uh, formal... no, on our on a daily fetal moment chart, we have written down this that the child mm -hmm. does not sleep more than 90 minutes. Yes, ma'am. So a uh, formal fetal movement counting okay may not be done, but awareness about fetal movement counting, as has been highlighted by, by our panelists as well as the experts, is must. It should be done after 28 weeks and patient has to report within 24 hours if she is continuously not able to perceive fetal movement. So, uh, Dr. Sangeeta Pava, although much has been discussed about this, Madam, what will be your take on additional testing as uh, NST, biophysical profile, color Doppler? Are they routinely recommended? How do you design? If patient is coming with a decreased fetal movement, then definitely I would like to go for the NST. NST is nothing else. It is CTG, that is cardiotrochographic uh, recording, uh, in which continuous electronic monitoring of the fetal heart rate is done because cardiac activity of the fetal heart depends on the sympathetic and parasympathetic both, both systems, which is affected by the fetal movements, even uterine contractions. And CTG is uh, picking with the transducer, we are picking the fetal heart sounds and toco dynam dynamometer is also there with which we are picking the uterine contractions. Definitely there is sleep cycles also. That is of 40 minutes during which there will be no fetal movements. And fetal movement accelerations is seen with the fetal movement. And there is a button that is a trigger button uh, which is given to the patient and then patient will click when she will feel the fetal movement. That is the additional benefit of CTG monitoring that is NST. And second is definitely biophysical profile. Uh, nowadays, uh, we are going for the modified biophysical profile also, in which amniotic fluid index as well as fetal heart rate is picked up. 
and amniotic fluid index is uh, just the uh, vertical largest brackets in the four quadrants and then uh, afi is from 5 to 25 is normal if it is less than 5 it is oligo and more than 25 it is polyhydramnios so we have to find out the amniotic fluid also and as uh, dr pt has already uh, listed that in biophysical profile we are going to pick the movements uh, tone respiration etc all the things we are supposed to pick up then only we are uh, if it is reactive nst reactive is there accelerations are there b to b variability is there then at least as sharda ma'am has rightly said for 12 to 24 hours baby is fine at that moment baby is fine later on what is going to happen if it is uncomplicated pregnancy say like no risk factors we can call her after 7 days and if recurrence is occurring she will come immediately will inform to the gynecologist or the midwives but if complicated pregnancy is there then definitely we are going to admit the patient if she has come from the far away on the daily basis and st has to be done okay so, so yes I, i stand corrected it is 12 hours 12 hours the action if there is no movement for 12 hours action must be done one must be done. not 24 hours okay. yes ma'am 24 hours there can be iud Um, i wanted to add also that doppler you know uh, doppler can be very useful in the monitoring of these cases and if you find that there is very good diastolic flow then you, you, you don't have to worry but if you know you sometimes because that is be one thing that goes off very early if there is absent flow then you have to be worried their biophysical profile could still be all right and i think in a, just now it is off the way but in a normal nst also the gynecologist must know eight scores are from the nst electronic monitoring and two are from the afi so afi must be part and parcel of the nst so for the benefit of audience we should utilize this opportunity if anything was not there was slightly muffled shella i don't know please hand look into the your audio yeah oh yes i don't know how to correct it but increase the volume and go near the sound okay i'll go near the sound so yes uh, we have talked about recurrent uh, decrease perception of fetal movement that should be uh, give, the clear instructions should be given to the patient about this particular entity and patient has to come back so ma'am much has been talked about reduce fetal movement perception what is our take on excessive fetal movements because many a times patient are coming to us if they are perceiving excessive fetal movements <laughs> the person who is feeling the fetal movements you know from the time we have made it conscious in in uh, person uh, uh, pe uh, people like me only always get high risk cases so we started 32 weeks normal can be they can start at 34 weeks i find a you know, person who is used to a normal movements of the baby when she says i have an excessive fetal movements this is the time for evaluation of that particular child again because uh, whenever uh, uh, there is a slightly anoxia also to the baby the baby will have increased fetal movements and i think it should be take, should not be taken lightly at all i think i will act and dipika ma'am i also give one question meconium and uh, baby died because uh, pg has sent the patient home with excessive fetal movement and yes. later after 24 hours when she came she was having thick meconium and baby died yeah excessive make a fetal moment have also been associated with uh, <clears throat> increased risk of fetal distress so these patients also need to be uh, checked you know by doing the uh, uh, the biophysical profile yes exactly because uh, uh, they represent fetal seizures induced by asphyxia or infection sometimes the fetus tries to uh, release cord entanglement or a change in fetal behavior uh, in response to noxious stimuli so it should not be over so hum logo ke heart attacks hote na kabhi jaise hum ja rahe and drive karke batate heart attacks to kehte aap you know take you know increase breathing and things of that kind of the same thing the child takes yes. uh, that it should be taken yes. light not taken lightly yes so the uh, common perception that excessive fetal movements are good and this is a people's perception the uh, the community is realizing that excessive fetal movements are actually good after having food it is normal to have excessive fetal movement but this should be educated to the public that fetal uh, excessive movements also warrant further clinical guidance and evaluation because they have been associated with uh, stillbirths 
as high as 10 to 30% of the females subsequently suffer a stillbirth after reporting even a single episode of excessive fetal movement. So, can, uh, I, can I just add one thing? Yes, See, different babies have different movement rates. Some women, you know, they in one hour they have 10 movements and some women will have four. So, uh, will you call 10 excessive? So, uh, what I tell patients is that if you have a next day, you know, is five times, 50% reduction in the normal movement count of yours is the one which you have to worry about. <coughs> Exactly, ma'am. So awareness about her own pattern, if it is changing, yeah. whether de decreasing or whether it's 50% decrease. Yes, then she should report to the hospital. So uh, coming to the next point, and this is a very good point. Case number three, 19 years at 34 weeks came with husband with complaints of inability to sleep comfortably. Many people report so. Her husband tells specifically that she is sleeping on her abdomen and is not at all comfortable with lateral positions. So they want a uh, reassurance from our side and Dr. Daraksha Pass. Madam, is there any role of maternal sleep positions in causing stillbirths? Is there worry, right, concern, correct? What do you say? Uh, hello, am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yeah, the sleeping patterns is an essential part of uh, prenatal care. First of all, we may say that uh, how the patient is comfortable in sleeping, that is important. But if she is able to sleep on a left side, lateral side, that increases her oxygen flow to the ureter kidneys and helps the patient sleep better. If she tucks her pillow in between her knees, that will also help her better. And uh, whatever makes her comfortable. But sleeping on her back, may put pressure on a vena cava, that is said, which may obstruct the blood flow and maybe, maybe cause uh, oxygen deprivation to the child. Counseling of the patient is important to maintain her sleeping patterns. Whatever helps her sleep at night is very important because there are a multitude of factors which help her to sleep. She may go for a walk, take milk before sleeping and anxiety relieving because some of the patients are very anxious and they may not sleep. So what a health her sleep, for a proper good sleep is important for a healthy baby and a healthy mother. So right, ma'am. But uh, we uh, want to uh, highlight over here is that maternal going to sleep position is extremely important and they should be educated about it. This is the Google search and a screenshot from my own laptop. N number of data regarding maternal sleep position and its causative etiology with stillbirth. So stillbirth is highly associated with supine position and the cause has been highlighted by Dr. Daraksha that it may cause venocaval compression. So a lot of studies and the largest study done till date, it was a case control study and it said that uh, women who are settling to sleep in supine, supine position on the last night of the pregnancy were significantly more likely to experience stillbirth even after adjusting for other factors like small for gestational age, smoking, or any other thing. So they have adjusted odds of 2.54 for having a stillbirth. So a role of aortocoval compression is more and it is an explainable and plausible uh, explanation for the causative etiology. This Lancet study by Cronin and colleagues showed that about 6% of late-term stillbirths were due to uh, going to sleep in supine position. So they used individual participant data meta-analysis. Large number of patients were there and they reported that it is significantly associated. Now, uh, Sharda, ma'am, coming back to you. If we are not uh, letting them sleep in supine position, then left or right, what is better? Ma'am, please unmute yourself. All these patients require counseling about their sleep position right at five months. And uh, the senior, the better to tell them that, you know, supine position is not right. So I always suggest them, I put a photograph in my uh, chamber that this is the way to sleep. You have, you should have a cozy three, four, five pillows so you can be comfortable, but you should not be lying supine. Chill should be there, which way or the other. It can be right, it can be left, it doesn't matter as far as I'm concerned. 
Okay, ma'am. Thank you. And uh, Tamki, ma'am, are you still there? So Deepika, ma'am, is back, ma'am. Uh, yeah, we were talking okay, about I was, I was going to say that the yes. same thing we talked about would matter. Naturally, you don't want them to lie flat. But nowadays, you know, there are very nice pillows available. Really long pillows. Yeah. I remember my daughter-in-law, she was not able to sleep. She was very uncomfortable, very big abdomen. And these pillows really help you to choose a side. You ha have you people seen those maternity yes, pillows? Yes, and we maternity really pillows. There. Ah, they really help uh, the women to so sleep comfortable. comfortably. Oh, and I recommend that to so many of my uh, friends and you know patients. Yes. So sleeping on side, right or left, doesn't matter. But they don't have to sleep in supine position. And with that, uh, uh, one patient who was accompanied by her friend who was living in working women's hostel for some work condition. She had experienced previous preterm delivery and new unit was uh, the, the new unit expired after 15 days. She says that she sleeps for only five hours a night, wakes up frequently at night, and she wants assurance as there is previous neonatal loss. She still is not able to come out of that. So, Naima, my question to you is: Is there any importance of duration, quality, nighttime wake up frequency in relation to causative etiology of the stillbirth? What's your take on that? Thank you, Dr. Sharma. Studies have shown that long periods of undisturbed sleep are associated with late stillbirth. So there was a study which was done in Auckland, which was an internet-based case control study. And it showed that uh, the women who were in the stillbirth group, they told that they had of sleeping for long hours. That was around more than equal to nine hours over the previous month. Also, those who had a stillbirth, they were more likely to report that they did not wake up or they just wake up for once in a while they, the night, the previous night when they had the stillbirth. So it suggests that long sleeping hours or if they are not, if the person is not waking up uh, in the night or is waking for less than once. So they have a higher incidence of late fetal demise syndrome. Also, there is a strong correlation between the sleep and uh, arousal and BP. So when the patient sleeps, the BP falls. And whenever there are arousal, also when the patient goes in a deep sleep, then the BP uh, falls more. There's a gradual more fall in the blood pressure. So when the person is arousing or is waking up in between, that causes an increase in the sympathetic activity. So it helps relatively to maintain the blood pressure, which is falling down while the person is asleep. So, so what do you tell your patient to sleep for how many hours? So if the person is sleeping for six to seven hours, that is okay. Because there are studies which have shown that sleeping for more than equal to nine hours in the previous month has shown more incidence of stillbirth. Thank you so, so much, Naima. Yeah, yeah. So, Shardha ma'am, uh, how do we counsel on the sleep pattern of the patient? Because so many things have been uh, shown about sleep patterns, sleep hygiene, sleep practices. I think I have to learn from you because people like us always tell them that seven to eight hours sleep in the night and two hours in the afternoon is desired. And I was not aware there's something like, you know, more than nine hours still but are waited. So I think I'm learning any something new for us. In my long yeah. practice of 50 years as, as a gynecologist, I've never heard something of this particular kind. Very, very interesting. Yeah. So, yes, this has been surging on internet also and people are conducting more uh, let research me, let and me, trials. Let, yes. me, let me be very clear with you. Google does not mean everything is the right information. You must see the authentic article, which is scholarly article. People like say, you have, have to read that at the article, you know. Exactly, ma'am. That is what our message is all about. That whatever is available on internet is not true. We have to verify. And this uh, study has warranted further research. And this was in one of the uh, uh, e-journals uh, of Lancet. I'll share it in the group again. And uh, again, as uh, uh, you have said rightly, that we were not knowing about this, even we were not knowing about this pattern. And uh, it has warranted and it has initiated so many clinical trials regarding the sleep practices. And that is the term that they are using now. Yeah, so, but, it is very, but it is very well known that even for adults, you know, sleeping for more than eight hours is not advisable. Yes. 
is not more is not advisable you're prone to many other conditions especially heart attacks yes. and uh, so yes longer hours of sleep also is not good yes in fact they have to go suraj se pehle uth jana chahiye aur aaram se 8 baje so jana chahiye 8 9 baje ye suraj wali baat to hum logo ko apne purane traditions ki baat karni chahiye the time jo time hai sone ka us time so aur jo time uthne ka activity ka us time jab ho Yes. But I think all all obstetricians are you know addicted to this binge sleeping. There will be thirty six hours on duty and then eighteen hours sleeping. So so many of my residents do that. Binge sleeping. Yeah, we are used to that. But when you're pregnant, you have to take rest. So I think six to eight hours of sleep. And uh, in fact, uh, one of the articles said that restless leg syndrome having it is also beneficial for preventing stillbirth, and that again was a new thing for us also. So sleep hygiene, sleep practice, and with that, Naima, just a small What question. What is restless leg syndrome? Restless leg Let syndrome. Let me. The people who have little varicose veins have a tendency for restless leg syndrome. They so you know, them. this this is I daytime we tell them you know that you have to use uh, you know. Uh, uh, support uh, of stocks and uh, things like that, but in the night I also tell them that it helps you. It helps you yourself too. Your movement are important at that particular time. So yes. uh, this is especially seen in patients with who have a even grade one uh, varicose veins. They have a, a restless syndrome. Uh, so uh, thank you and uh, Naima, your patient. She uh, is accompanied by her mother-in-law. She has been fasting for seven days, and her mother-in-law is really concerned about having chances of intrauterine fetal demise. How do you counsel her? Fasting, feasting. Uh, please unmute yourself, Naima. Studies so far has not shown as any association between fetal demise and fasting. various systemic meta analysis uh, and observation studies were done along with randomized control trials and they do not show any any association between even ramadan uh, fasting that is for 30 days and uh, intrauterine fetal death not Can even add something to this because you know we are catering to a uh, predominantly muslim uh, population and this question arises every time they will fast and then they will be admitted with decreased fetal movements if you go through this you know uh, these studies naima i i'm sure you must have seen majority of these will be done in the middle eastern countries where they have people working for them they are not the ones staying in you know they are all staying in the air conditioned houses they have people working for them and they have a very good you know diet and nutrition they they, they have a hemoglobin of 15 16 so A, a, a lady with a hemoglobin who's starting pregnancy with a hemoglobin of nine or seven, there is going to be a lot of difference. And in my personal experience, I, I always educate them that look here, if 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 it's a, a religious concern with them, that look here, you are allowed to not fast and do it later on. So what I have found, if you go through these all these you know reviews, most of them will be in the Middle Eastern countries. Where the you know the socio-economic status is, is yeah. absolutely different from our patients. So what do we tell our patients? They are they are asking about intermittent fasting also. No, so, uh, madam, as far as uh, this part is concerned, I think uh, in Quran it has been these people are exempted, and as far as our uh, religion is concerned, elders are very concerned. They don't want it. हमारे यहाँ तो एक करवा चौथ होता है उसमें भी वो मदर कहती करना नहीं है. so this is what it is you know the child cannot take that long fasting uh, uh, in a good way that's the way we we don't advise them so usually in the second half of pregnancy i discourage them in the first 20 weeks i think it's not going to make much of a difference even if the nutritional is is poor for her so uh, our take on this is ke okay if there is no data supporting uh, this evidence still we can warn the diabetic patients that rebound hyperglycemia after a period of fasting increases appreciably 
the chances of having stillbirth. So if we are dealing with diabetic patients, we have to be very strict with them. Then, then it's your responsibility completely. You don't have to fast and then feast and then have, uh, uh, have increased chances of having a stillbirth. But in normal patients, yes, the counseling goes long way as uh, has been told by Shatha Ma'am and Tamkeen Ma'am. Uh, for religious reasons, we don't have to fight with them. We have to counsel them. We have to talk to them. And people are quite easy to go with that. They understand the fact. So I thought I I find, I find elders, elders in the house never uh, force them to I thought hypoglycemia is more dangerous than hyperglycemia. Yeah, definitely. But Dr. it's Deka, now Dr. Deka, it is uh, for us also hyperglycemia intermittent also three or four times is you know can cause heart attacks and whole lot of uh, diabetic complication as i think the same holds true for uh, the spikes are to be avoided the and for, the, for the indian population even when they are maintaining euglycemia they are more prone to go into ketosis acidosis yes ma'am so shardha ma'am i had a special question for you any foods having causal relationship with stillbirths that I know of. Yes. So because people have myths regarding this, we are a food centric nation obsessed with food, want to avoid food. Still, uh, people are coming to us that I think that is the most commonly asked question especially in cases where there has been a previous still. But so yes, it is very true that there is no particular food that has to be avoided. But uh, this is what I could find that caffeine intake, excessive intake, especially more than 300 milligrams is associated with having odds of uh, increased rates of stillbirth. Then uncooked and unpasteurized food, especially yeah. causing toxoplasmosis, listeriosis by eating smoked fish and complementary medicine and herbs, which are unresearched in the context of fetal uh, effects should be avoided and we should consider them. So um, the last is open for forum. All the panelists can give their inputs regarding excess, uh, regarding intensive and uh, strength training exercises in third trimester of pregnancy, especially I would like to skip this case. What is the obstetrician's perspective on advising your patients for exercising during pregnancy? Because we talked about people's perceptions. Let's talk about our perceptions now. How many of us are telling, yes, it is fine. Go ahead and do the strength training. Now, we, we say our patient that they can indulge into mild to moderate amount of exercise in uh, workout. They can do yoga, meditation. They can do, play even sports. But where there is danger of falling, they should avoid. I say when Serena Williams can uh, participate at four months of pregnancy, she participated in the tournament. So... But that was her stamina. Her stamina is very much different from other days. You know, not everybody is athlete. But yes, people can indulge into moderate amount of exercise, walking, back strengthening exercise, stretching. That is very much advisable to them. And I ask for sweating starting from 37 weeks. Okay. So, so Naima, uh, I wanted I, to add uh, that moderate exercise is advised till she is not uh, feeling dysnic or uh, dizziness or fatigue. And she should do it in cool place at least. During summers at least in the cool place she can go for. Otherwise, she will feel more uh, uncomfortable. And it is contraindicated because in our tertiary center, patients are coming with the IUGR. We are contraindicated. Cardiac disease, pulmonary disease, or patient is having placenta previa, hypertension, or if there is previous risk of the previous preterm labor, or again, there is chances of the preterm labor, and again, cervical incompetence in all these exercises contraindicated. So Otherwise, on the contraindication, yes. 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 So, uh, the obstetrician's perspective in a large study published in 2018, study have They uh, obstetricians recommend decreased exercise rather decreased exercise in third trimester, and that was done by half of the obstetricians, mm -hmm. which goes against because we can always ask them to squat. For um, go for walks, brisk walking exercise, but we have to take certain things in consideration as was discussed by Dr. Pava and Dr. Naima. And uh, skydiving, scuba diving, exercising at high altitudes, activities that in, can increase the body temperatures, especially Vikram Yoga, they have to be avoided, lest there is no effect as regards to stillbirth is concerned. And we can safely 
advise them the exercises they are comfortable with and if they want to train then it has to be under the supervision of a trainer what so, about swimming um, yes ma'am swimming what about swimming ma'am swimming, swimming is allowed, allowed. Swimming, swimming is allowed, is allowed. yes yeah. but uh, diving provided, is provided the pool is clean yeah <laughs> <laughs> yes ma'am so diving is not allowed swimming they can do and uh, take to practice point from this discussion is information about sleep position and duration is important emphasis on food hygiene has to be uh, done if not formally you, done you then didn't you, you did not take uh, opinion of dr tamkin and dr deepika deka about the exercise of 33 weeks okay ma'am so we are here yes tamkin ma'am what i follow in the rule of thumb and uh, looking at literature what i found was that whatever amount of exercise she has been used to she can continue but like dr pawa said that we have to be very uh, particular in the working up the case that there is no contraindication okay. as the third trimester you know uh, 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 as she reaches the third trimester there is an instability of joints so we, i think for a, any woman it is yoga which is most su suited and of course uh, for diabetic i always encourage exercise deepika deepika yeah i think the same thing nothing to add not as, as far as i am concerned i think one thing at a time ya to pregnancy kar lo ya wo kar lo i feel uh, you know everything should be in moderation you can you can't do two things together yes ma'am i i i find many gynecologists are many and doctors have are my, my patients and you know they have igr and you know they have to decide about it what they should do i said i tell them look ya to bachcha hi paida kar lo aur ya phir bhai apna job ki baat socho And people take a off doctor so four or five months off in case we find you know that significant IUGR is there. They have to. In life, me, one one time, me, one one problem, let me, you know, four four problem, let me, thoda chalenge. So yes, yeah, so true, ma'am. Uh, but yes, आप आप मुझे बताओ doctor तम कि आपको ऐसी कई ऐसा problem आया है कभी? नहीं आया कभी भी. नहीं एक आध बार कभी नहीं उल्टा आता है कि जो ये police में लोग होते हैं वो आके कहते लिख दो कि हम exercise नहीं करना है. because i don't want to do the exercise <laughs> that oh, i should not mai zyada gadbad bhi nahi hai doctor wo they can i always tell them you work till the last because the baby will require your holidays so you don't take holidays but i don't tell them that you know ki aap chale jao char mahine char mahine ke baad delivery ke ek mahine ke baad aap marathon bhi mein chale jao wo nahi kare bhai ye cheez ek time pe hi hoti hai so what we have to understand is Uh, okay physical activities moderate walking but we have to tell them about rise in pulse rate that has not to be more than 10 to 20% while they are exercising walking or doing anything and they have to refrain from adventurous and leisure exercises and that is what just shatta ma'am has highlighted you can either do an adventure or pregnancy because pregnancy in itself is a big adventure which pays off well so we want all those pregnancies to be resulting in good outcomes not in stillbirths and that is what uh, we talked about people's perception in today's uh, panel discussion i'm so 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 grateful to sharda ma'am tamkin ma'am and deepika ma'am for staying with us till last and so grateful to all the wonderful panelists for giving their valuable inputs you all have added value and worth to this platform thank you so much madam last in the last 3 4 years i have learned you know to do a ecg in every pregnant patient and i think you know uh, and the, the point which you have highlighted not more than 20 30% pulse rate should increase during the exercise that particular part also should be taken seriously so uh, uh, final words from tamkin ma'am please uh, dr asna was supposed to our joint secretary was supposed to deliver the vote of thanks she's traveling thank you so much shaila and dr sadna in spite of being so busy both of you arranged this uh, for a long time we, we have been you know discussing that we must have but i think the wait was worth it uh, dr shada jain thank you so much for all your wonderful inputs your experience sharing with all of us and for gracing the occasion dr decca uh, i already you know we are so much indebted to you for giving us your time and all the panelists and so many of jnm cis are here i'm such a proud moment for me and shala we learned so many new things and in a very you know your imitable style and very interesting way so thank you everybody so much for being here thank and you and last but not the least my sincere request on the behalf of dr sadna gupta to be with us on the 18th 
Thank you. Sir. I hear again tell you North India Gynecologist Forum is a, not a rich organization. It is only based on thousand rupees fees for five years for people. So you will not find you know, the kind of glamour and things like that, but it will be a simple get together. We would like to meet each other because we have seen you on the on the WhatsApp or in, on the media. We have not met you in person. So I'm sure, sure Delhi will be great host. Thank, thank, you. You. thank, thank you, everybody. You, Thank you, Shalda ma'am. Thank you, Deepika ma'am. Thank you, Tamkin ma'am. Thank you, Shalda ma'am. Thank you, Shaila. Thank you, Shaila. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Thank you, Preeti. I liked your comment today. Thank you so much. Okay. I have to thank you. From my side, we had... You deserve. you deserve this compliment. We had three institutes. Shalda Chan ma'am, Deepika ma'am, and Tamkin ma'am. I don't call you teachers. I don't call you people. You are institutes. You have been great teachers. We have been your great admirers, just not for words, but we all feel it from heart. And I think you all know that. So thank you so much for giving us now, this here opportunity. Here I just wish to tell you, I here I just wish to tell you, my head of the department, Professor P.K. Devi, did not have a single day training in gynecology. These people were all FRCS. The gentleman came from there, got the head of the departmentship of surgery, and all the ladies got the head of the departmentship of gynae. So it is your experience, experience, and experience matters. But you don't raise Kathina Docs up Hindustan, you cost the boss seriously. Your years of experience matter. Yes, ma'am. So true. And thank you so much. Thanks, thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you Shala, ma'am. Thank you. I learned a lot of things, things today. Thank you, Shala. I learned a lot of things today, too. So I you appreciate all, it. We all learned, right? Yeah. Thank I think you, Shala, we should work on this on the infographics now. Yes, ma'am. So I mean, to you, you must see to it that the stillbirth rate is prevented. Sitting at NMC, National Medical Council, two things my other colleagues can't swallow. Why a lady could not be saved of PPH when you knew hysterectomy? No excuse. Dr. Sharda Jan was bachi ko kitna bhi bachane ki koshish kar le. Wo ye kehte hai, madam, inna hysterectomy kyun nahi kari? ये क्यों ये इतनी कोई क्यों ये फ्यूचर और ये सब चीजों में लगे पड़े रहे और ये ये लेडी बच, बच्ची मर गई दूसरा सिंह चीज है स्टिल बर्थ दे कनॉट सॉलो आज के टाइम पे वो टाइम चले गए द 10 12 बच्चे होते थे आज के टाइम पे स्टिल बर्थ कैन नॉट बी सॉलो इन योर स्टडी आल्सो डॉक्टर साला यू सेड 12% नाउ मेनी गायनोकोलॉजिस्ट आर राइटिंग जीरो पेरीनेटल मोर्टेलिटी इज माय वर्ड so this is what we have to work hard and i think you have to really work hard with uh, we uh, gynecologists who do not have you know big big degrees uh, but still we can definitely save the baby so you have to work very hard and your interaction should be more frequent with the gynecologist yes thank you thank you very much thank you so much